What's up, angels and ninja men? It's Wednesday night. <laughs> Time for the fun. So here we are. I see that we've got about 10 people in the stream so far. Please let your friends know that like conscious and uh, entertaining content that we are live right now. I'd love to see more people pile in. Yeah. So how's everybody doing out there? Let me know in the chat. I'm super excited for this conversation. We have Michelle Lundquist from Michelle's Healing Home and Rachel Munoz will be joining us shortly. As is tradition, she is restarting her computer at the last minute. <laughs> it's because whenever we get started, that always seems to happen and no problemo. So anyway, how are you guys doing out there? Gabriel, you know, we didn't get to talk to you a lot last week because there's so much gravy getting ladled and I'd love to hear from you. What's uh, what's in your cup right now to empty out? How you doing, buddy? Doing real good. Real, real good. Um, right now it's harvest time. Uh, got to clear out all my veggies out of the garden. I got uh, so many acorn squash. It's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's kind of, that's my thing. I got to get a, get everything out of the garden. So I don't feel like I wasted any, uh, you know, my time and energy, uh, can everything, jar everything, start storing, you know, uh, and capture all the seeds. Nice. Beautiful, man. Can't yeah, beat that. That's, yeah, that's kind of my jam. Uh, also, wrap my head around what the fuck with the queen. <laughs> that's pretty wild. Yeah, wild. interesting how they announced that whole death 911 days after Cooties kicked off on 3-11-2020. Ah. Is that, is that some of the gravy? Oh, my God. That's about all the gravy I've got on it. I've mostly been able to ignore it, to be fair. Yeah, <laughs> I've ignored it, too. There was a huge Virgo weave, though, that Mario put, pointed out with it. That it's interesting that it happened during Virgo, and that Virgo is sometimes referred to as the Queen of Heaven. And so oh, yep. he was thinking about something with that. And then we were kind of tripping out about, well, you know, she's probably, she, there's a good chance she's been dead for a while, you know? So they waited to announce it perhaps for in the season, but who know, who really knows, but it's been interesting for sure. Either way, it seems like a fantastic loose funnel for all of those <laughs> crown countries like <laughs> England and Canada. Gross. <laughs> What's up, Rachel? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I have issues with uh, StreamYard mostly. <laughs> well, I'll put a label on you so that we know who we're talking to, not just the mysterious I voice. I got it. I got it. Yeah. I'm slow, but I'm working there. <laughs> <laughs> good to hear you, Rachel. Yeah, good see. I can see you guys. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. So I've also invited Kyle to come up from Typica New Herbs if he wants to join in on this conversation. Oh, He's welcome to pop in at any point. I saw him in the chat here. I know that you and Kyle are friends, Michelle. Yeah, that's awesome. I That will be so, so sweet if he joins. Come on in, Kyle. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, home, hometown. I mean, it's crazy. Like, uh, I had no idea even really they were there until maybe three or four years ago when I went home to visit and where their shop is, is in Bayview. And it's one of my favorite parts of Milwaukee. And I was oh, down man. there with my mom. I'm like, Oh my God, there's an herb shop now. And because when I was living there, there was no herb shop. And so anyway, it's just one thing after another. And um, I think when I first went there, they were in their old location. And then the last time I was one of the last times I was there, they had already like remodeled and moved across the street and stuff. Beautiful. So beautiful. Everything they have there, the layout, they've done such a good job building it out and stocking it up with wonderful things. So it's a good thing to have in Milwaukee because there's not many resources for that kind of stuff out there. Speaking of herbs, I saw that you are doing an elderberry offering right now. That's perfect for this time of year. Do you want to talk about what's going on with your healing home? Michelle's healing home.com. Sure. Yeah. Thanks chance. Um, yeah. So the full moon offering for this month is elderberry and reishi mushroom syrup, which is one of my OG products I've been making for close to a decade now. And, uh, 
it's kind of like revamped and kind of been stepped up over the years. But uh, this year it has fresh elderberries from our property on in it. Uh, so that's a really special addition. And I did a lot of deep work with elder um, uh, over the winter. And I did a whole like protection, like ritual sort of thing with the elder tree. We had some deep communication. So the medicine is I felt extra potent, potent this year. Um, and yeah, so that's going on. That's, uh, you can get that, uh, my website, you can go to michelleshealinghome.com and you can also email me at michelleshealinghome at Gmail. If you're interested in that. I do recommend people go over to our website and sign up for the mailing list. So you can see whenever these goodies are going out, which as you mentioned, full moon offerings, I think that I would have probably benefited <laughs> to have been doing as we talked about with uh james in the last interverse episode how nature's like letting you know what you need before you need it i got some sniffles as often i do at the beginning of september and if maybe i was doing elder and reishi before uh that happened it would have never maybe happened that way so <laughs> anyway elderberry is awesome i have some in my backyard too it is definitely a lot of berries at this time of year ready to go yeah totally yeah, you can still take it now, you know, if you're feeling it, it'll, it will definitely help to just, you know, start the process of detoxification. That's one of the things I'm really great for is moving stagnation, any kind of stagnation, specifically, though, anything that's like stuck in the chest, but it's really great for the blood. So it can just, it just really starts to get things moving. And then the reishi, of course, um, as he, you guys were talking about last night, just great for the immune system and mushroom of immortality. You know, I even give that to our cat. It really just gives him a nice boost. So all together, it's a really great combo. Yeah. Now that I think about it, elderberry, when you look at how the berries are actually forming on there, it is a lot like that doctrine of signatures. You could apply it to the lungs and the way the lungs are all branched out, right? Like the, the bushels of berries kind of have that look going on. So it makes sense that it could help move stuff through the chest. Hey, what's up, Baldy? Nice. What's up, Ben? Oh yeah, man, yeah. the next anniversary episode is with Balderson. We already recorded it and I finally get alchemy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's going to be a good one. Like it really all clicked this time. So can't wait yeah. to share that. He gave us a great explanation of the process of lab alchemy from like, you know, beginning to end and how when we got into how that reflects across the rest of the fractal. That process is really good. I can't wait to put it out. That's awesome. Yeah, that's exciting. What's new with you, Rachel? Oh, man, just all the things. <laughs> Lay it on us. Uh, well, if anyone has not heard, I have officially begun Druid courses. So I am a bard right now. There are three different grades and everyone starts out as a bard. So going through uh, just some basic history stuff and kind of getting some things memorized and really diving into what that means, what all of that means. And um, they're definitely starting you out, you know, understanding the eight festivals and the times of years, solstices, equinoxes, you know, it's like, you don't have to practice anything, but the whole point is to be connected to nature. So at least consider <laughs> observing those. And I love those, they're my favorite anyway. So it's vibing, it feels really good. It just the whole thing makes my heart so happy. So I'm glad that I'm exploring the path and, you know, we'll see. I'm interested to see what else it offers, you know, what the deep stuff is. So I feel like you were already a bard in spirit. So it's great that you're getting the certification <laughs> certified bard. <laughs> yes, I'll take it. Yeah. That, that feels really important too, you know, to take that step and, and to kind of have that. So it's doing a, getting more focused, I'd say this year we're all leveling up big time big time so you ladies actually requested to come on tonight and i'm glad you did because we're gonna have a lot of fun do you want to go ahead and take the lead and introduce us to the conversational topic that we're going to be weaving into here tonight absolutely yeah michelle and i are starting kind of a series <laughs> we just wanted to really discuss um, aspects of the feminine and definitely aspects of the masculine. And she had the idea and then I had the idea and we kind of came together on it because it was so funny. I'm like, I can't believe you said that. How brilliant um, to talk about this with some gentlemen. And she 
she thought this would be a great idea. And I agreed that, you know, you and Gabe would be great masculines to talk to about the masculine. Um, We've just been talking about the feminine, but we'd love to discuss the masculine from a feminine perspective with you. Because um, yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, you've you've heard Balderson and I go off, and <laughs> we get a lot of a lot of the masculine and a lot of a lot of the feminine. It's a good mix, but we'd love to continue those conversations here with you. A conversational alchemical marriage about to take place. Yeah, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> well, go on. Let's get into it. <laughs> Well, the first thing that's wrong, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that, that sounds exactly how I expected. You know, with the masculine's problems from the feminine perspective. Yeah. Well, first tell us everything first, we're doing wrong. I have flowers for all of you. So Yay. I kind of wanted to start it out by saying, like, just regardless if you're the you're a man or a woman, buy your partner flowers because or just pick flowers for them. Sometimes, you know, there's the stereotype that the man always has to buy the woman flowers, uh -huh. which I think is awesome. And yes, you know, that's, that's a great gesture. But I also think that, you know, just showing your man like, hey, I thought of you. Well, I saw these gorgeous flowers and these are for you. So these are for everybody, all of you and everybody in the chat, everybody watching now well, and later. Pull those back so. up. Let's make them big. I want everyone to really yeah. receive their flowers. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Awesome. What do we got here? We've got we've got uh this is a Hopi sunflower. We've got a, uh just a regular different type of sunflower here. There's a calendula right there. This here is amaranth. So it's like literally the amaranth grain. And this amaranth in particular uh can be used as a natural dye. So it'll turn the the you'll get like a nice pink, like a light pink from it. Uh, what else we got? There's some zinnias in here and some rosemary. So yeah, got these from the garden and I just wanted to share flowers with you guys. So this is going to be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> We're about to get raked over the coals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The gift, the gift of, of uh, I'm sorry. No <laughs> medicine ahead of time. <laughs> You'll need this. <laughs> no, that's funny you bring that up though, because that's one of the things Mario and I were will talk about of like, you know, um when somebody messes up, you know, they'll buy a gift or something like that. But like it's like, well, you can buy gifts all day and give flowers all day, but if the if if the behavior doesn't change, then like nothing is going to change no amount of flowers or chocolates or candies or whatever. So it's like these sorts of things, these little gifts, uh, it's like <laughs> Oh my, God. oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Which ritual are we doing now? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> oh, I, that totally threw me. Thanks, Ben. I totally lost my <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. For those listening at home, uh, not watching, Balderson said, at least it didn't include petroleum jelly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's really funny. So yeah, oh, to give these sorts of gifts, not from the ego, not from a bruised ego or whatever, you know, because the ego is, you know, we need ego, it's just the healthy, productive ego, but not wanting to give these sorts of things from a place where it's just like, to boost someone's ego or your ego to feel like you have righted the wrong by giving a gift or whatever. Um, anyway, so, but these come from a place of love for all of you <laughs> and beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very yes. nice. I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's funny that things have become so polarized into, you know, certain gifts are for certain people. And it's only based on the polarities. It has nothing to do with what they might personally enjoy. You know, I think that's more of what, you know, it's like, we don't think that men like flowers, because that's not a side that we're shown. Because <laughs> yeah, in stuck. truth, who doesn't actually like flowers, you'd be like, either crazy or lying to yourself if you didn't enjoy one of nature's right. most beautiful expressions that is ever that you could ever find in nature yeah agreed agreed and and i would be very unhappy if i gave flowers to a gentleman and he was like thanks <laughs> or like weird about it you know? <laughs> like, wow she gave me flowers <laughs> 
like, oh, that's that's nice. <laughs> I'm glad you're pointing out the whole polarity of that particular gift because it makes me remember that I wanted to point out, maybe this is completely obvious to our community, but when we say that this is like advice to the masculine from a feminine perspective, maybe not advice, but you know, this is just going to be a conversation on the subject of gender that obviously all of us have both components to make us up. So, you know, if you're a female out there, we're talking to your masculine, the inner self that is the masculine part. Right. And so, you know, I think I want to give an example right now of like, something that occurred to me today that I, I realized now, like I knew that there was something going on in the world and in the, especially really it's more the internet that I didn't like. And I'll explain this, but today it finally clicked, like what was wrong with it? And that would be, <laughs> okay. So I witness a lot of people that are mm, calling themselves one label or another like the conservative label side in the political arena. And there seems to be a huge amount of attention and energy being thrown in the direction of uh, streamers and commentators, talking heads who are calling themselves conservative. They might even go so far as to be like, quote unquote, Trump allies or QAnon or all of these different labels. But the the pattern that I'm noticing now that I'm recognizing why it's been so distasteful for me the whole time it's been a thing is that there is this extreme emphasis in a lot of this particular corner of the internet. And it's a large corner. It's maybe more than a corner of like the whole show is about pointing out the mental illness in the other side of the polarity. Right. So like they'll just show the most extreme case of like why this liberal person is so horrible. And basically the gist of it is like everything is messed up until those people fix themselves or something. Right. So this is, in my opinion, like a corruption of the masculine role, because if your whole platform is pointing out the mental illness of the other side, bashing, judging, beefing with them zealously, then you're really not actually achieving anything that builds something better in the world for one. And also the other side of this or the, like the big, the big sneaky part of all this is that these channels have moved further and further into the uh, calls for deterioration or outright elimination of uh, institutions in the nation. Like the whole big thing right now is like, FBI rating conservative people or whatever and SWAT teams and like, oh, be afraid of the government and we need to dismantle the FBI and disband the FBI. And that's a separate conversation in terms of like my evolving thoughts about government, governance and government. Uh, and maybe we can go into that too. But what is really seeming to happen is that there's this push for the destruction of the institutions and destruction of the structure, if you will, without any idea of how to replace it or what to build instead, while also seeming to completely miss the point that just a couple of years ago, it was the so-called left that was calling for this exact same thing, like defund the police, disband the police. And to me, it's like, okay, obviously there's some other agency promoting and expanding this idea uh, of the destruction of the institutions in the country whether it's from one side of the polarity or the other. And to me, it's obvious that like communism has always had that playbook of find a way to subvert the institutions of the country. So all this being said, what is being promoted is like manly perspective, conservative, you know, the, the, the right politically is the masculine. All it's really doing is bitching and whining about the other people, the other side that it sees as mentally ill, offering no solutions, but plenty of vitriol and acid to like melt all the structure and all the institution around it and like remove people's, you know, good faith in each other <laughs> and in the, the country at large. So uh, Owen Benjamin was talking about this exact thing and he was calling these type of so-called conservatives uh, sub left because they're really doing like the leftist job while masquerading as a, a right. And in a political sense, in a gender sense, the left and right can actually be kind of equated to masculine and femininity. 
because the traditional idea of conservative or right is like, you know, a strong father government that protects you, but leaves you alone. And the leftist idea of take care of everything for me, nurture me, government is mommy. And I obviously <laughs> we, we want to be a balance. We don't want to like hate one parent and, uh, uh, you know, deify the other or whatever the case may be. And this isn't to try to make this conversation political. It's just pointing out how like, this is what's passing for the strong male online presence right now in the aggregate, in the larger picture, in what's popular. And I see it as like extremely subversive and not what the masculine would do at all. The masculine wouldn't go and fight verbal fights and, and bully the side that they called that they say are the bullies. The real true masculine would like not engage in fights that were pointless and would just build something better, build something outside of that, you know, show the truth through action rather than spitting acid at all the people that they think are the problem. So that was a long rant, but like <laughs> maybe that'll get us warmed up into some of the conversation and uh, you know, who, who wants to take it from here? I think that was beautiful. <laughs> Um, I was just listening to uh, one of Michael Tessarion's videos on the Dragon Mother, and it really vibes with a lot of things that you were just saying. Um, I don't want to point fingers, the toxic feminine, but I'm not going to not point fingers um, because it is all energy, you know, essentially. It is that, that receptivity getting into toxic devouring, and that's what we see with things that are breaking down. You know, we don't want these structures in place um the hierophant is all about structures right he's the one that has to do all the work <laughs> in order for the feminine energies to flow the masculine does all the work and the thing that you're describing chance is that chivalrous nature we look at that as masculinity um you know bros <laughs> white hyper, hyper masculine yeah this white knight <laughs> this white knighting that's going on and it attracts you know feminines that that require that energy to survive and that's not necessarily healthy. Um, it makes it really difficult, I think, for, you know, okay, I'm going to say it. I'm, I'm a very masculine feminine. It makes it difficult for somebody like me to get into my feminine because the only examples I might have are other masculine feminines who are awesome. That's kind of what you're aiming for because that means that I can flow with you. Um but it makes it hard for me to only be receptive. Like I look at those women and I'm like, I cannot ever be like that. And if that's what femininity is, I don't want that. And I also, I, I don't want this, this only women only thing. It's, it's so disrespectful. It's just so, it's so selfish to, to put men in that position, I think. But, you know, that's kind of my initial thinking about all this. <laughs> Yeah. And to riff off of that, I mean, I feel like I'm kind of in the same boat and I feel like I've been in that boat my whole life of always kind of feeling more like um, on the more, not even on the more masculine side, but I guess like having that balance without even really understanding that I did, but always kind of um, like not a hundred percent understanding just like what you're saying rachel of like if this is what it's like to be a woman like i don't know what that means then or like i guess i don't relate to it a hundred percent and it wasn't until i really started to like step in to my actual like more divine feminine role that then i began to see like oh it's been in balance this whole time but like society actually portrays it a different way. And I think that it goes for men and women. So it's like a, a man is supposed to be this and then a woman is supposed to be that. And it's like usually this Hollywood glamorized version of everything. And it really throws a riff in for each, each sex really. And, um, you know, one of the things that I just really like to think about is the chaos, the aspect of chaos and the aspect of the woman being more of that chaos but like the man being the order of that but actually the order comes from chaos so it's just this thing that it's like this perpetual wheel that's always spinning in and out that one cannot exist without the other and that's why i think these politicized like 
gender bending things are really strange and detrimental to everybody. Um, and then you have things that, for example, like in Portland, a few years ago in the herbalist community, there was this huge thing and it was called plants against the patriarchy. And I remember going into an herb shop and I saw this for the first time and it was like, they had like, you know, like bags and, you know, like, you know, you could buy postcards with it on there. And then whoever was running it had tinctures and stuff like that. But I remember thinking like, I'm pretty sure the plants would not ever endorse something like that <laughs> because that's a total opposite of like the balance of mother nature. I mean, how, how are you going to say plants against the patriarchy? It was really strange. And so there's, mm -hmm. oh, there's been these, all these little tiny things, these micro movements that I've seen kind of pop up, um, it, especially within the herbalist community. I think particularly in Portland, because it is such a liberal city, that something like that would even fly. I don't know if it's around anymore, but it was one of those things that just made me really like question a lot of things. And it also made a lot of sense as to why I never really felt like I um, fit into that circle, um, you know, necessarily, because there's a lot of politicizing around it, having to do with gender. And it's very touchy. You go to an herbal conference out here and you're yeah. they're talking more about politics and gender than they are like herbs sometimes. And it's really frustrating because like I came here to talk about plants, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got a thing to interject on this that just popped in my head. You're talking about plants against the patriarchy. It is interesting how the left, which is the unbalanced feminine in terms of how it manifests in the fractal of the larger life with the political things is often the left is like, you know, their version of being subversive is to be witchy, but like edgy, evil, satanic, black magic, witchy, usually <laughs> not usually, yeah. but that's like, that's a, it's marketed that way a lot. So I just want to point out back to the whole aspect of the, the fake right and the fake left really being the same thing. Uh, that neither one <laughs> when, you know, whenever you're not really living up to your masculinity, it makes you is equally ineffectual and uh, corrosive and corrupt as the feminine not living up to its femininity. And that's that two becoming one in a sense. They're no longer they're no longer creating the dynamic disequilibrium that is required for charge to carry and for life to flourish. And instead, you have mirrors of toxicity reflecting each other. So this very much reflected in the way that the uh, <laughs> MAGA people, which MAGA is like a rank in the study in church or whatever, Satanist church, there's a rank. <laughs> people have probably heard this, but a lot of the MAGA people in the channers were doing their version of like meme black magic. Like today, we're going to make Hillary fall down and so again, it's just the toxic reflecting the toxic. And I think maybe it's Gabe's turn. Yes. Lead on us. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Uh, I think uh, the bounce back is going to be beautiful, though, you know? Uh, you know, there's a, uh, economy in the comedian industry that's going to be, you know, beautiful to see the, those shoes filled up. It's kind of fun to think about, but, uh, uh, that's all I got on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have a, oh, oh, go ahead, Rachel. Go ahead. Yeah. I have a question for you guys. Um. Do you think that we, if there's all this taken down of the patriarchy, because we all have big brains here, um, no smooth brains on this channel, would, first of all, we could define, we could spend some time defining what patriarchy is and is not, um, and why people might want to take it down. Because, second, would you agree that we might not have actually seen any patriarchy that we're not actually seeing what true patriarchy is. We're trying to do all this takedown, but there we've never seen it. So we're not really taking it down. What are we actually taking down? What is patriarchy? What does that mean? Because I don't think we've ever seen it, at least not enough to know 
what we're taking down. <laughs> That's a great point. And I think you might be right with that. You know, a lot of times I think about the, um, the fact that it might have, yeah, it might be a matriarchy like through and through always has been. And it being like everybody, oh, the patriarchy, oh, it, because it's a patriarchy, that's why we're in the state we're in. It's like, well, maybe not. I don't know. You know, because when you really look at the aspects of the dark feminine, it it is kind of like a lot of the things we're seeing. I always think of like your mom saying, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Yeah. Like that is the power of the feminine aspect but it's also just the power of like the dark feminine and like what her role is is like i am the executor and i am the creator and so regardless of what you think or they think or whatever it's like at the end of the day i think that the matriarchy or the the the, the mother goddess the feminine is is always going to kind of be in charge you know and one of the things mario and i were talking about last night that he brought up is that so like we're talking like balance obviously is like very important, obviously in all aspects, but like you were going to have all this like distortion of the political stuff or bring down the patriarchy or whatever. And that stuff is always going to exist. Right. And that's out of balance. Like that's out of whack, but like that out of balance -ness actually creates balance on the whole at the whole, like the bigger scales. And then we were talking about how it's like, it's almost like two sets of scales. So you have like the, the out of balance, weird, like political shit. And then it's just like, oh, but that actually brings balance to the whole thing. It like has to exist in some weird way. Um, so yeah, I don't know what you guys think about that, but we were kind of tripping out on, on thinking about that sort of stuff last night. It is amazing how the terminology becomes itself weaponized and talismanic i got curious and i looked into my favorite dictionary webster's 1828 dictionary for the word patriarchy and patriarchy was a very simple definition the jurisdiction of a patriarch so then i was like okay well what did patriarch mean it means the father and ruler of a family one who governs by paternal right so smash the patriarchy by that definition means snap or smash family rule basically because it th that definition in my opinion does not exclude a matriarch if you will from having any type of say yes. or right you know but in terms of who protects and who governs as in like uh enforces what is right and wrong that is a, a masculine energy type of role because they're bigger, obviously, and they're wired for it. Like it's what men naturally want to do if they see somebody messing with their family or their family, if someone is out of line, the masculine checks that. So anyway, here's the other definition of patriarch. So by the first definition, perhaps there was a patriarchy at one point in the sense that people did self-organize by family. By the way, the other talismanic word that the, uh, sort of toxic uh, f version of the feminine, which will be the leftism politically is always going on about is racism. Well, in this same dictionary of the American English language, race means family. <laughs> so <laughs> similar to what we're talking about here with patriarch. So they smash the patriarchy and racism is literally like destroy family unit, destroy. And family is really Man, Balderson and I were getting into this about alchemy last night, about how the process of alchemy is taking the memory in the form of the life energy from the plant and bringing it up. And we were talk talking about how that applies to the idea of like whether or not you die and get your memories wiped as your salts return to the soil or whether or not you do the alchemical marriage when you die and retain your memory and your essence blends like your soul and spirit blend kind of mm. and you thus retain the potency and the memory of who you are and that a big part of what's gone on in mo modernity uh, like the the larger so the micro fractal would be you and your personal life and your memory and whether or not your memory goes on after you die or you reincarnate with a memory wipe 
based on how much you purified alchemically during your life and followed the steps that nature lays out. But the macrocosm of that is your family ancestry memory. So how many of us are living with complete ancestral amnesia? You know, how many generations back do we remember? Do we know about? Has that line been broken? And so in a very, very real way, like the fight against racism, the fight against the patriarchy has been successful because we're cut off from our roots past a certain point. Now, all of that being said, the other definition of patriarch, and by this definition, we sure as hell have a patriarchy, but it's a crypto patriarchy, is <laughs> in the Christian church, a dignitary superior to the order of archbishops. So we're talking about high ups of the Vatican and behind the scenes, the paper C is governed by the papacy. So, <laughs> you know, again, and Tessarian has a really great work on uh, communist origins from the Vatican that they spread those seeds. And anyway, fascinatingly, Sicosio came to that conclusion in his work as well. And makes a really great strong comparison between Christianity in its sort of degraded fallen state of dogmatism and closed mind, being closed minded to the actual deeper mysteries and communism as being a similar thing. And it is kind of like spiritual communism. It's like you're born and you're assigned your spiritual understanding and it's limited. And anyway, that's a whole separate weave. So I think I'm done talking now, but. The funny thing is, in this dictionary, 1828 Webster's Dictionary, there is no word matriarch or matriarchy. That was not a word. So is that because women were just so oppressed back then? Is it because this is a dichotomy that was created as a divide and conquer tactic at a later point through word warfare? I don't know. Or maybe there's a third option. But to me, all that is very fascinating. Great. Thanks for looking those up. Oh yeah, Webster's 1828 never never disappoints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's interesting. That's kind of that's kind of what Tessarian was getting at too, is that this it feels old to me. Um I was reading some other texts and a lot of the a lot of the cult shures that we're looking into often lead back to some strange castration ritual. Um, it leads back to some ancient wound that has to do with this divide. And I mean, I, I see it regionally, honestly, um, but we also just don't have some records. So it's hard to say what everyone's response to a splitting apart and coming together was. Um, back then, but it's very apparent in some cultures how how that played out. Um, I'm thinking specifically Greek cultures. Um, <laughs> you know, all this not understanding relationship as people start to um, procreate and spread out, you know, our relationship to mother and son and father and daughter and even father to son and who who's got power, who doesn't, what our responsibilities are, what we wish they were, um, you know, micromanaging each other. It's wild. It's just absolutely wild. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. You know, I wonder if, if that term was created. I, I'm curious if it came about um, just because of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, the Hierophant is always drawn as the Pope. It's only recently, you know, as people start to move away from that, you know, from religion, that people start drawing that card differently with a new understanding of that energy. One of the decks I have specifically works. I didn't buy it from this, but I did appreciate, you know, some of the fluidity of it. But it does, it does change some of those things to be less gendered in understanding so that you kind of get the sense of the energies rather than the words that are attached to them. And I appreciate that about it. But yeah, I I remember watching a reader say that, you know, we were going to start seeing a lot of Hierophantrix energy come out. So I think that's, 
at the time I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And then now that I look back at it, I'm like, but is it? Because we already have the high priestess. <laughs> that seems somewhat subversive um, to me. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Uh, so where I'm at right now is I'm thinking about, obviously, we can see feminism as a big psyop that happened, right? <laughs> In a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. And this, and no one listening needs the disclaimer that, you know, we're not sexist here. <laughs> but so I think maybe the really important thing for the masculine energy is to know your purpose and relentlessly pursue your purpose. Right. And the feminine energy is about supporting the masculine energy's pursuit of its purpose. So this can happen in a dynamic of yin and yang between two human beings, or it most importantly needs to occur in the dynamic of yin and yang energy in the one being. And if it is, then the external yin and yang relationships will mirror that. So I think what happened to the yang at a certain point long way back <laughs> but particularly you know maybe there was a resurgence of the yang aligning with purpose here in the so-called new world after the colonies were well established and uh there was some modicum of independence for a while if all that story is true that you know what made america great was that families produced a lot of their own resources that could and yeah, so that's purpose driven, providing. That's a, usually the masculine purpose that is driving it does relate to the idea of providing in some way, you know, hunter gatherer, right? Uh, and at a certain point, that purpose got broken. Now, what broke the purpose for the masculine was when masculine energy was disconnected from the receptivity of yin in a deep way. So there was a point where most of the people here would have known, like I can grow my own food. Nature will provide. I'll receive from nature if I fulfill my purpose and how I steward my own land. Right. And then more and more of the urbanization occurs, more and more people lured to, you know, jobs and factories and things like that. Jobs that are far from aligning with their, deepest purpose for whatever reason. And I'm being super general here. So don't like, you know, yeah. this isn't a history lesson, but this is all an example. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and yes. so when, when the male workforce lost touch with its receptivity aspect, which means like working for paychecks rather that to, to survive with like, you know, the survival instinct gets corrupted and, the 40 hour, it was more than that at an earlier point, but you know, this idea of the work week comes about and you have to just do this grind and grind and grind for your daily bread rather than the type of lifestyle of like the gentleman farmer Renaissance man that seemed to have been at least in some, to some degree, uh, established in the U the U S before <laughs> some serious falls and how and what caused those falls, same corrupting forces as we're facing now, I believe. Um, so that gentleman, Renaissance man, farmer had a connection to yin energy in the form of, you know, trust and receptivity that if they do their work, what they need will, they'll have what they need. And then the wage slave factory worker era begins where most of the work being done is not even <laughs> has nothing to do with like their alignment with their true deepest purpose, which is uh, why it gets soul crushing. Right. And then I'm being kind of meandering here. Let me just fast forward. Then feminism comes along and feminism is like, look, you should have all the rights of the man, but the rights that they're fighting for is to be disconnected from yin energy and receptivity mm -hmm. and, Bingo. and grind and work based on a fear mindset that if they don't grind and slave themselves out, they won't have enough to provide for themselves. Right. Bingo. So yeah. that's kind of where I'm at. And we have, <laughs> I think that's what happens and what men are 
really hopefully relearning now the the true men is the faith in nature and universe and the way life works that following their purpose they will receive what they need and i know i've been bogarting here for a minute but like i do a lot of tunings for people and most men that i tune have weakness on the left side of their energy body most men that i ever tune their their issue is that they're not open to receptivity that they're focused on what their goal is they may have found purpose but they're still energetically imbalanced where they spend all this mental energy and focus on the to-do list and what must be done. And there's never the, or not enough of the relaxing and letting it be, which is the receptivity part where you let, you have to leave space for it to come to you. Right. So, <laughs> and now we have women that have adopted that exact same energy model for themselves. Like I want the right to go also be a slave in a cubicle. I talked to my own mom about this a couple of nights ago, and she worked most of my life when I was a kid. Uh, when, when I was really young, not as much, a few days a week, but as time went on, full time, overtime, she still works that way. And uh, in our conversation, I was like, I think one of the biggest conspiracy theories that I believe in is that it it's actually paradise for a woman to be able to live at home with their children and not have to be the breadwinner financially. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, I wish I could have done that. <laughs> like there's regret there, you know, but now she doesn't even know how to live without the full-time grind, even though she doesn't even need to work that much. Like she could hire people. She's got a successful business, but she still is there like managing and struggling with the, uh, just letting it be in the receptivity side. So women lacking that also raise children and men uh, and girls who are, you know, <laughs> they're both the Yang side and the Yin side are getting out of whack. So that mm -hmm. was a lot of talking. I'm sure people have thoughts. Okay, I'll stop now. That, that, no, that's great, you know, because I think, I mean, at least for on a personal level for me, I mean, I remember when I started having these inklings that I think I'm supposed to be more like, I, I think I'm supposed to be concerned more with taking care of Mario in terms of like you're saying, allowing him to basically like nourishing him so that he can do the things that he needs to do in order to go out and get and, and get it, get the bacon, whatever you want to call it. And as I started to think about this more and more, I would feel guilty because mm -hmm. then there'd be people like in my age range or other women that they make you feel bad for wanting to do that. They make you feel mm -hmm. like you're less than a less of a woman if you wanted to actually be a homemaker, you know. And I had a handful of conversations with different people, even a boss of mine that I had at the time that was very discouraging of me doing that. But I knew deep down that it was like mm -hmm. what I wanted to do and what I needed to do. And actually, Mario was supportive of that, and he could see that as well. And he saw that when I was assuming that role, that I was much more happy, I was much more productive, and so was he. And so then it just like something clicked for both of us. And I still pursued my own, you know, business and have a project and have focus and all that kind of stuff. So it's not that you have to just give up all your hopes and dreams and wash dishes your whole life. I don't think that that's the answer. And I think that that's what pop culture and society wants it to seem like the fifties housewife wears the dress and pins her hair up and walks around in high heels and cleans the bathroom. It's like, no, that's, that is not, that's not even realistic. It's really not how it goes, you know? Yeah. I, I would love yeah, I for, me, for me, my benefit. And the woman <laughs> benefits from that too. Like if neither person is homemaking, you don't have a fucking home. <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> if you're both slaved out, then, you know, things go to shit elsewhere. Okay. I have to share this got, sh interestingly, this was shared in the universe telegram channel earlier in the week and uh homie who shared it had no idea we were going to be talking about this today. So very synchronistic. I'm going to, if you can't hear the audio, well, let me know. It's not super long. I'm sorry that it's a TikTok. Oh, I did watch this. Oh, okay. nice. <laughs> yes. 1950s woman meets the future woman. 
Welcome <laughs> to 2022, where you can do anything a man can do. I am so excited to finally be here. You are going to love it. Feminism has done so much for women. Do tell. No more aprons, first of all. Oh, do we finally have a butler to cook for us? Oh gosh, no. You'll just eat pre-made greasy crap out of a bag on your way to and from work. I suppose that sounds convenient. So I get to work outside the home? Totally. You get to sit in a cubicle all day while you stare at a computer screen chugging coffee. So liberating, right? I suppose. I'm at work all day. Will we finally have a Rosie the Robot maid? <laughs> No, you'll still have to do all the cleaning. That's what your weekends are for, cleaning and laundry. Oh, and errands and yard work. Wait, so I have to work full time plus still manage my home full time? I mean, you want to have it all, right? Okay, but what about my husband? Is he amazing? What? No, you're not married. You live alone with your cat. What? You do date though, a lot. You can just have sex with whoever, whenever you want. That sounds kind of gross, actually. Just pick them off of this app. What about pregnancy? Oh, there's this magic pill you take, totally wrecks your hormones, but keeps you from getting pregnant so you can, you know, knock some boots. The pill is magic? Well, it's mostly effective, but don't worry. If by chance you do get pregnant, you can totally just kill the baby by having an abortion. Why would I do that? So you can get back to work, duh. Someone has to fill that cubicle space. Okay, am I at least happy? Uh, I mean, yeah, as long as you don't skip your antidepressant pill. Another magic pill. Gotta cope somehow. I think I'll just stay here. Get to have purple hair. Yeah, that's comedy that actually hurts. It's like, uh, that's awesome. It's too real. <laughs> Dude, homie Romy. Nice. That's great. I haven't seen that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's like, if you're not caring for something, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, and it, and then everything's so hypersexualized that it makes being it. I feel like for me personally, it's made sisterhood really difficult. Um, and even like being around gentlemen and being like having a brother relationship because everything's so hypersexualized. Oh, you're receptive. It's like, well, that's not in that doesn't mean. <laughs> <laughs> like you know we're gonna not a receptacle right i'm not a receptacle <laughs> right <laughs> right but we see a lot more men that have become receptacles yes yes that's yes, true that's true yeah the the hypersexualization is an interesting one because it's like um you know all of this is in my opinion where we're at with all that stuff is basically a result of unresolved trauma and mm -hmm. whether it's ancestral trauma, it's like a grand birth trauma, it's also all of the, you know, encounters we have as people going through our lives. But I think like when there's unresolved trauma of any kind, it usually ends up manifesting in more of a negative way. And I think especially with the sexual trauma, it's what it is like some of the hardest stuff to go through as a human, in my opinion. I mean, you try to talk about it with anybody and it's it's a very touchy subject. And it is for a reason, because once you start healing that stuff, that is when you really do start to realize what your divine feminine and masculine is and what yes. it really looks like to have it and harness it because sex can be very healing. And it's it's something that should be looked at as a sacred act. And it's um, the way that it is nowadays. And I think it's probably always been this way. It's not like, you know, there's only been promiscuity now. You know, I think that that's been around for a long time. But I think that it, it just it's almost like pouring salt into a wound. If that's what you're continuing to engage in. And this is just my opinion, even from personal experience. It's like you're like pouring salt into a wound every single time. And uh, even as a, as a woman, as somebody who's gone through this, it was like going through those times in my life. It was just like, what's up, Kyle? Yeah. Hey, how y'all doing? Great to be here. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. It Thanks. was, I was seeking my divine partner and that was like all I really wanted. And there's this thing that you feel like, well, this is the way to get it right. To like engage in sex. But because I was just continuing to do that, I was actually blocking my own divine feminine, which was then blocking me from finding my divine masculine partner that I could actually do some real healing work. And I think 
pulling the woman out of the household, breaking up the family, it actually, it, it, it furthers this trauma because when you have both in their roles, this is why my project is called Healing Home. You create a, a place of healing. Uh, your home becomes your altar of a place for all sorts of healing to happen. And so if you're breaking that up, neither neither person, children included, aren't going to have that opportunity to really like tap into these deep wounds or the, the, the beginnings of them or even know where to start when it comes to trying to heal these sorts of traumas. And I think that it just continues the splintering that we continue to see um, with all of this stuff. So, yeah, let me riff on that. And then I want to introduce Kyle proper. Yes. <laughs> so I, uh, a lot of times people that talk about these gender related subjects, it tends to take a side, like this is the side that ruined it. You know, and even if you go back to that clip, that TikTok we just watched, it makes it sort of look like it's the woman's fault. Right. But Okay, so a lot of the sort of more pro man side of these type of conversations will get into this idea called hypergamy, which to put it simply is that like females uh, seemingly, and I mean, I think this is a real thing personally, will uh, decouple from a partner in pursuit of one that it, you know attempts to attract them that they see as a better option. And this is often like, this word's often painted on females as like, this is why they're the bad one because they're not loyal or whatever. But, you know, it's really, in my opinion, this is a dynamic that exists because it's part of the female role of like vibe checking the masculine. And if the masculine is like really off purpose and not pursuing purpose as it as they should be, then they're going to be less and less attractive to the feminine. So as this like schisming of the home and the the uh, trap of the so-called and totally fake sexual liberation thing began to happen, this was also the same time that men were getting more and more pulled into a sports ball and entertainment and Buicks and, you know, TV and all these different things that pull them further from purpose, you know? So to me, it's like perfectly logical that then you would see <laughs> their feminine counterpart losing the attractive and magnetic connection to them. But then on the feminine side, the, the feminine side mostly did not realize that what they were meant to be attracted to was also purpose. And, and then you see a lot of like conflation and confusion of money or status with purpose. Right. And that's not necessarily true. So Anyway, all that being said, I think both sides are needing to come to a rectification within themselves. And like the male recognize that part of why the 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 home is split and wrecked and the attraction and magnetism between the yin and the yang has been uh, the d dynamic disequilibrium has been disturbed is because of not following purpose radically in the, any time in your own life that you had a schism in a relationship you didn't want to lose in a similar way like look back on yourself and like, did, <laughs> what were you doing? Were you, <laughs> were you more focused on the relationship? Or were you more focused on doing what you're here to do as a, a, hum a man? And then the same for the female, like, did you ever lose interest in a guy and go after another guy because you were allured by, because the, the shiny things that they might possess in a materialist sense, that is exactly the same type of trap as what on the male side, getting led away by sports ball from doing what you're here to do or, you know, watching TV. Right. I hope all that's making sense. So yeah, <laughs> I think it's a good thing that, that females will uh, kind of intuitively or instinctively lose attraction to their man. If their man's not doing what they should be doing. Uh, a lot of guys now because of this white knight and like chivalry code idea are so focused on serving their woman that they're not serving their higher purpose. And then it's like the more they chase after trying to do everything for their female, the less interested the female gets. And then they feel the female will feel guilty. Like these, you know, that's just this really bad cascading breakdown of the attractive force. And I think the principles of what creates that attraction need to be understood. And then when they, when they are, then it's way easier to <laughs> know when and how you're getting off base and like why your relationship does or doesn't have spark. 
Yeah. So what's up, Kyle? <laughs> he walked into quite a cool conversation here. Like this is, uh, <laughs> you know, a little spicy. Hey. Now, this is Kyle from Tippet Canoe Herbs, amazing buddy that I got to meet in person at the Bertaria Fest. Freaking awesome to have you here, dude. I'm going to share your links in the chat here. Hey, thanks, Chance. Yeah. What's up, yes. Kyle? What's up, Michelle? It's awesome, uh, awesome to be hanging out with you and yeah. uh, you all. And uh, it's quite the honor to be on the Vibrance and um, offer a little Yang beard stroke of uh, uh, disequilibrium, dynamic disequilibrium to our <laughs> to our group here. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I was. Uh, I was I was uh, thinking about something that you mentioned earlier in the in the show, Michelle, and um, thought maybe I could uh, offer a weave um, and maybe reciprocate the um, endorsement of elder, of your elderberry syrup and mm -hmm. um, and bring the conversation, uh, which has been awesome, um, at least uh, maybe mention it about in the natural world how we see these types of uh, you know, energy is playing out in the natural world. So I'm an herbalist for those of you that don't know out there. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about when you were talking about elderberry um, was the, and the, and the elder tree is how elder gets its name from the Norse name Holder and Holdermore was the name of the mother of the fairies. So the name of the elder tree is derived from this like feminine, um, this feminine archetype of the fairy world. And some of the signatures I see in that, I mean, we were talking about signatures earlier, you're talking about the berries, but if you were to take an elder tree and break it in half, uh, the stem, you can actually look through it, it's hollow. And plants that have a hollow stem tend to represent you know, um, the tunnel that goes to the other side or the underworld. Um, elder grows by sending lots of runners out through the ground. And there's lots of lore and mystery and um, uh, warnings from, you know, grandmothers in the English countryside, not to let their children play underneath the elder tree. And I was doing a class under the elder tree the other day and just sitting outside. And I was, I was like, oh, I, I know why. It's because I, I was like, I got up and my, my butt was all stained from the berries. I was like, oh, that's the reason why the grandmothers say don't let the children play by it. But I think there's something else too. Like they, they also think, you know, that the, the children will get abducted and they'll, the fairies will bring them down there and they'll, um, they'll invite them to tea and then they'll come back up and it's like 18 years later or something. Um, and the masculine archetype of the, of the king of the fairy world is the hawthorn tree. And if the hawthorn tree is, um, you could visualize it. It's a tree that's kind of, it's, uh, it's in the apple family. It's very craggy and hard. And it's also low and bushy, kind of like the elder tree. But it has these thorns, these three inch long projections. Um, and it's very, uh, these projections are there just to create space and protection. So it has its abundance. It offers its abundance. It says, yeah, you can come and take these berries from me, but you have to do it. You have to do it mindfully because this is my space. And um, so both of those, both of those trees together are kind of like the masculine and the feminine dynamic, I think in, of the Kings of the fairy realm. And of course, if you, you know, are into that kind of thing and you, or your ch like children, of course, I, I think are really, uh, they can engage with fairies quite easily. They, you know, build a little fairy home and take a picture of it and see all the little orbs and stuff like that. Or where did the M and M's go? You know. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was the that was one thing I wanted to offer because um, because I haven't tried your elderberry syrup, but it's made the the um, news of it has made it to me that it's really good. So um, there's a plug for the fairy the fairy home companion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you, Kyle. And that was beautiful because, yeah, I love the, I love that, that the Hawthorne and the elder. And it's funny about the Hawthorne, like with the spike, because I think about the elder, there's always like the folklore of asking the elder per, for permission before you harvest any part of the tree. 
and that somebody who doesn't ask for permission could be like have ill will put against them. You know, there's all these like kind of little fairy tales, if you want to call them that. Um, and I also look at it as like a crone tree, sort of like there's a crone energy to it, like the wise uh, elder witch who lives inside of the tree, you know, that's beautiful. I love it. Guys, you got to go to Kyle's website, tippacanoeherbs.com. I shared it in the chat, but I'm literally buying a tincture right now while I'm in the middle of the stream. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You want you? nice. No, I want to buy it. This is great. Uh, I have often like sort of, I don't know if it's sort of like uh, just part of my energy dynamic or whatever it's described in my human design chart, for example. A, uh, and in Gene Keys too, I, t I can easily get like constricted airways. And so I'm trying out the young lung. <laughs> and also there's times in my life where I wasn't the kindest to my lungs too. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And yeah, I'm going to try this out. Also cool. the sniffles I got last week, there's still a little bit of <laughs> in there. So mm -hmm. can't wait to try this. Everybody should check out Tippecanoe Herbs. So many good products. You gave me really nice Aries themed incense, which I've been enjoying during tuning sessions. So thank you, man. Um, yeah, we, had, we had a great time hanging out. That was awesome. Uh, being in Missouri, it's been over a week now, but I still feel like whom, 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 whom. maybe it was that big G fork that, that you gave me uh, a third eye spot. To <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. And I got, you know, I got um, this morning, I was still thinking about it. And uh, somebody from that area called me up this morning, like out of the blue and was like, Hey, I heard you might want to move here. And I was like, uh, I put it on speakerphone so my wife could hear. And uh, I just thought, I was like, I can't wait to tell Chance about this. <laughs> yeah, Missouri, that's a great place. That tuning we did at the festival with you was amazing because I don't think I've ever done a tuning with somebody where they could, they knew whenever I hit the spots too. So like I have this weird, I don't know, superpower. It's my own body's way of communicating with me. But when I hit spots of stuck energy or something I'm specifically looking for, like the edge of the field, my ears pop and I would hit a spot and my ears would pop. And right as it happened, you'd be like, I felt it there. <laughs> and I'd be like a few feet away from you. And I, I just have to say, man, like, uh, I hope you do pick up the modality and start teaching yourself to do biofield tuning. Cause it is, you've got the, you've got the already got the sensitivity and attunement, if you know what I mean. And I'm sure if I could teach myself to do it from reading her books and making my own chart of the biofield anatomy to memorize with practice, I know you could do it. So I hope you do, because I want to receive my own medicine sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where were we with the gender talk? <laughs> what else is wrong with men? In can a we great talk about place. Um, <laughs> I mean, no, really. It's this is perfect. I mean, how many I'm meeting more and more men who are into things that have been, uh, well, they've been relegated to the feminine realm, you know, herbs. That's, that's a chick thing, you know? <laughs> oh my goodness. It's so ridiculous. It's like, I don't know, guys, it's, it's pretty earthy, but you should probably know what you're eating. You know, um, people who are into survival, you're like, well, that's, that's the direction I want to go in looking for somebody. <laughs> Because it's someone who's going to know, hey, Rachel, don't just eat everything when you get out into the woods. Because because I would try it. I'd be like, hey, is that going to be good? Because I'll, I'll eat it. <laughs> you should probably tell me no. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear more from, from you guys on, from the men's on some of this stuff too. Like, how do you feel about, about that? About, you know maybe being discouraged along those lines or making it uber masculine, you know, that that's a big thing too. You know, survival stuff is, you know, very geared towards men. Um, I took a pistol class from, and the woman who, you know, started it, started it because most things, you know, firearms related are geared towards men, you know, which, I mean, that's fine. And it's great to have a woman teaching, teaching me how to handle things as a woman, that's wonderful. Um, but it is something relatively new in that realm. So what do you guys, how do you men feel about those things? And um, yeah, I do, I am curious to hear about, you know, if we can backtrack a little towards 
some of the sexuality, do you find that some of that stuff affects brotherhood and, you know, the way that you relate to men and, you know, that type of stuff. So also Gabe's been very quiet. Yeah. It's freaking me out. <laughs> right? I, I passed the ball to him earlier in the chat and he's like, that's all I got. And Kabir over on the Rockfin side, he's like, this is weird to hear Gabe at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, one thing that uh, is stranger and stranger the longer I see it is the program of, uh, you know, brother on brother. Um, and uh, the more I think about it, the, the more I realize, you know, it's been like a, a warning in the past, you know, that was what they called the Civil War. Um and now that we have kind of decoded the placenta twin spell of everything, we uh, we see that the the value of the brother on brother it's not only like you can't trust your fellow man, uh, but you can't trust even yourself because of your relationship with your you know your spiritual twin, uh, your your higher center, uh, so to say. Um, so I, I guess, uh, I guess that comes to mind. Um, in especially going forward, I think there's going to be a lot of it, even the word German, you know, German means a brother, like, you know, Benjamin is a good brother. Mm -hmm. Um, so in a lot of ways, some of the most beautiful things, and this is another kind of funny thing that we've, a pattern that we've brought up is all profanity, all cuss words start with something sacred. And then you got to like come in with the nastiness and defile it, you know? So it's like mother fucker, son of a bitch, you know, all these super sacred things, uh, we have this weird ritual of defiling them and calling it a curse word uh, when things get the most intimate, actually, which <laughs> brings me to my bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Beautiful segue. You know, I'll say for myself, uh, as I am in, you know, I'm, involved in the healing arts which you a lot of times the whole like the whole concept of energy healing is more commonly practiced by women more of a feminine thing it's intuition based right there's all that but you know one thing that is different about the particular stuff that i do than just sort of like holding your hands out in a faith-based healing or rate like very general reiki is that there is actually a structure to it and i think the masculine side, the yang side, it loves structure and because it's detail or oriented. It's like looking at the pieces, it's focusing. And when you focus, you're only seeing one thing in front of you, not the whole. So uh, I don't see why more guys wouldn't want to get into practicing it, even though it's like biofield tuning as a practice is way more female practiced. Yeah, I see the thing I'm doing as like technician work. You know, the cars have parts and those parts need to work a certain way. And maybe that's a different make and model, but the concept of how the car works is the same, right? And the human energy fields are kind of like that. Not that we are able to be broken down to completely mechanistic terms, but there is a consistency to it. So, uh, and with the herbalism, I can't speak to that specifically, but I have noticed that again, with structure and being detail oriented, wanting to be able to understand all the parts and not the holistic thinking that yin is more uh, defined by, that this type of knowledge of <laughs> being able to recognize and catalog all the things around you, being encyclopedic with your knowledge the way that Kyle is, complete encyclopedia. Uh, we went on a, a walk at the park by my house and we couldn't even... <laughs> We spent like 45 minutes in the very first garden of the park. And he was like telling me all the things. And to me, that's uh, 
super masculine idea to catalog and sort and and know all the ins and outs of the details and like you know that's females that can do that that's a yang thing that a female is expressing which is healthy and fine you know we both should express both sides as rachel pointed out with tessarion's work on the dragon mother that like we need females to also step into their heroic masculine as well so all that being said i think to go back to blaming things on sports ball again <laughs> <laughs> that I I just sold like six books of comics, six boxes of comic books to a comic book shop. Like I had a, a serious wow. problem with collecting comics. Okay. And <laughs> I've been wanting to get rid of them. Gabe was here when I sorted it all out, which helped me to sell it later down the road. <laughs> wow. Was it your Spider-Man? No, I kept all the good ultimate comics like that sweet side collection. I just sold the ones that I knew I'll never touch again. But anyway, Things like that, comic books, collectible trading cards. Not that there's anything wrong with them in and of themselves. And, you know, hobbies are just for fun. That's fine. Games are fine uh, in moderation or reason that doesn't interfere with purpose. But I think all that type of stuff, like how many guys out there don't know how to fix a car? M me. But they know all the lore about every character's backstory and how it all interconnects in World of Warcraft or some video game, right? So I think uh, part of the sacred masculine is co-opted by that stuff. We do it to ourselves, but it's kind of introduced to us in a way while we're really young and presented as if that's not, to a lot of us, as if that's not a problem or an inversion. And then we're taking all that yang energy of sorting and collecting and categorizing and knowing all the details and applying it to stuff like TV shows and, you know, fiction. <laughs> and this is a big part of the issue too, is that like fiction is taking over or, you know, it can't ever actually take over, but in people's minds in the mental and imaginal space, that real estate is getting more and more taken up with fiction that has no bearing on our purpose, generally speaking. So, but I would love to hear Kyle talk about being an herbalist as a, a man and, you know, doing witchy work like that <laughs> hedge, witch work. <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking about it. Uh, actually, I was, I was asked about my thoughts earlier today because I just um, hired some new people and now my shop is filled with women and they were asking me, what is it like to be? Cause you know, before it was like me, the boss, and then my wife, and then we had a helper. And now we have like three or four new people. And they were like, what's it like to have all this um, feminine energy? And I was, it was at lunchtime and I was digesting and uh, tired from my infant son keeping me up. And I said, manageable. <laughs> and I thought, uh, and then they, they were kind of busting my chops about that later today and in the next later in the week. And I was like, yeah, but you know, I think that's a pretty good way of thinking about it because, uh, because that's what I really like to do. I like to just have my hands in things and I like to work with my hands and I like to create and project outward into the world with the things that I create. And it's really, um, a great trade for that. Um, and, and so, because, you know, it's, it's, it is a craft, it is a skill. And I was also thinking of, um, earlier about, you know, a lot of my teachers, um, that, uh, that I've learned with are men and it's kind of interesting because, you know, the, the field of herbalism, there's maybe one, one guy for every 10 women or something like that. But a lot of the books are written by men too. And I mean, that's changing lately. You see a lot more. Uh, women authors. And it makes me think about earlier in the conversation before I was present about, you know, um, you know, was it, was it because there was, you know, that was the thing that was the thing to like categorize and create and put things in. And it was kind of something that, that the men did while the, the women who were, who were the majority of the uh, people, you know, in the field of herbalism were actually tending to their families and to their communities. And they weren't really projecting outwards into the world. And um, so anyway, I was thinking about that. But I was also thinking about earlier today in, in herbalism and another aspect of, um, of the sacred masculine and sacred feminine in 
a product or in a, a, a particular type of work. And that is with, I've been working a lot with aromatic herbs. So aromatic herbs have their own unique kind of um, psychoactiveness to them. They, when you, when you smell something aromatic, it puts you into a different state of mind. It takes your attention elsewhere. You know, you can smell, you can have like a, an experience where you smell rosemary and now all of a sudden you're, where is that? Where is that coming from? And you're, you're out there. So it's just a real subtle psychoactive switch in your mind. And so I've been working with aromatics through distillation. So I've been making hydrosols and I've been working with aromatics through incense making, as you mentioned before. And with the hydrosol, which is a uh, aromatic water where you're putting the plants into a copper still. And this is uh, Balderson probably knows a lot about this or everything about this actually, but uh, the, the, the water moves up and it, and um, you're using the, the volatile oils of the plant, which are like the um, vital principle of the plant and you're separating them and you're recombining them. And then they, they come out in a colloidal suspension of the water. And the way that I really like to use this is through like strengthening the field, strengthening the, um, you know, the, the water that, you know, we have, we have water everywhere. There's water all around. So when you spray this, it kind of, I think it deepens our receptivity to what the intentions are of the plant or the, or the distillation process. It can make us more receptive to things. Um, and when I work with incense, which is something where you're, you're creating a phallus, right? You're making a, I make a cone or I make a, a jaw stick. And you light that sucker on fire, and and instead of it, uh, it, it turns. It has it has the structure, unlike the water, and like you were saying earlier about the structure. And then also, when what, what's left is the ashes or the salt, right? And um, what is that? That's like they're both they both work through prayer and through strengthening our field. And um, um, but I think that the the incense has more of like you know it's going straight up, it's going to heaven. It's got the fiery masculine principle, the hydrosol has got the, the watery, watery feminine principle. And it's really fun to work with both of those and then to feel, to feel those together in the field um, and the fields that you're working with, and then also use those in a prayerful way. So um, yeah, I was, that's uh, as, as far as herbalism goes, I, I am constantly thinking about the, the dynamic between the masculine and the feminine. And, um, and that just occurred to me today. Beautiful. Yeah, one thing um, that Desarian was talking about was um, artistry, that men have, have been robbed of being artisans. Um, at the end of the interview he was in, you know, he was asked what one of the solutions was to all of this, and it was to get back into the arts for men to start creating. You know, I, I mean, we all are so wowed by like Amish or whatever, and it's like, well, so go make a table go make some chairs, spend some time creating and allowing yourself to make something beautiful or something you're proud of, or, you know, that's, you know, you want to do and do and do. I mean, people spend hours in Minecraft. You know, if you want to learn a new hobby, learn to create the world around you. You know, we were kind of joking in the spiders chat um, about how there are some tribes where, you know, they're, they're not focused on material things and they'll switch homes. <laughs> you know, you switch all your stuff too. Um, but, you know, I was like, well, we could do that now because we all shop at the same places <laughs> and you would never know the difference. You know, we're all, oh, you have the same Ikea furniture. Oh, you got that painting it, you know, whatever. You know, there's just hardly anything, you know, wowed. And, and we look at antique pieces like they're gold because they are somebody did that with their hands somebody crafted that craftsmanship you know i was just thinking chance while you were talking um about eastern eastern practices and and they're you know androgyny is kind of this normal thing that that's making its way this way but what i'm noticing is that when it gets over here well and just in general and maybe this is just my own thing with it but i've noticed so much of it's about aesthetic and really it's about the flow, you know, the positive, pure dance is in flow. It's in that creativity. You've got people like Miyamoto Musashi, the greatest swordsman in Japan, but he's also a poet. He's also does 
pottery, you know, I mean, painting, he, creating things. So there is this, that's how you balance is in that creation. You create the world together. That's, that's what that harmony is really about is creating the world together. So just thinking about all that. <laughs> Yeah, I love this. It's like um, what you're describing might look androgynous, but it's really like both of the poles of the dynamic disequilibrium are strong and distinct in the being. You know, he is a swordsman and a poet, <laughs> a gentleman and a scholar, all of these things. The Renaissance man that I was trying to describe of an earlier time, that was my attempt to point out you know, what it looks like to have the yang focus and activity and purpose while also the yin receptivity and intuition and creativity. And whenever you kind of like just have both of those halves broken and toxic, you have neither half. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're left with a uh, nothing. Well, and I think when you're, when you're doing these things out of the goodness of your heart, the aesthetics come naturally. Like you can, you can see when you look at somebody who's trying to be, you know, both, you can tell and like, oh, I think that person's trying a little too hard. <laughs> and then you can meet people who are working this balance and you can sense it. You can feel it. You can see it in the, the choices that they make up for their own personal selves. You know, maybe it's the particular shirt they're wearing or the bracelet that they choose or you know, there, it just shows up naturally It without trying. You don't have to try to exude both because you do. That's, I think, the biggest difference in, in the way things are going now is that there's this trying way too hard because there's a lack of understanding on what these energies are. Yes, I 100% I agree with you on that stuff for sure. And I think because, and that's why it's so interesting with like the internet culture, um, you know, some of the people that are even here have met in person, some haven't, but, you know, we were talking the other day just about how when you're in somebody's presence, you feel these things. These are the things that you pick up. And I think we all are antennas walking around, you know, and it's whether or not we have our light on and when you have your light on, you're able to see somebody else's light. And I think that there's like this, um, just kind of like we were talking about before, is like there's the shaming of being in your, your like uh, divine place. And what's that about? You know, I, I, uh, I don't know. I just think that it's something that has been perpetuated throughout pop culture just to keep the discord to keep each other from like finding these connections. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's very strange, but I love this topic so much. And I'm just, I just wanted to take a second to say, I'm really grateful <laughs> to be talking with all of you because this is something that like Rachel said in the beginning, we, we kind of were like, we need to talk about this. And then I thought this is something that I think everybody just would benefit so much from hearing just even like there's so many people that have never even heard about divine masculine divine feminine like they might not even know what that what those terms even mean and i think even just saying it putting out it it out into the ether is like beginning the cycle of healing of just somebody then being like hmm what does that mean i'm actually going to look into that and then they might ask a friend or they might ask their parents or whatever and you just start this chain reaction um of people just getting more interested in their own self, because I think all of us can agree that it all comes back to self at the end of the day. And if you're not in tune with your own self, then it's almost impossible to be in tune with anyone else. And then let alone all the things around you. I love, I love this. I have a new appreciation for the completely random title I gave this show. <laughs> <laughs> Sacred Masculine Ninja Angel. Yeah. <laughs> I read it and I was like, oh, damn. So that was the uh, phrase that I put into the AI art generator to get <laughs> to get the art for this episode. <laughs> so awesome. Sacred Masculine Ninja Angel. So, <laughs> but really, really, I don't know who I heard say this. It 
it might have been on a crow episode. It might have been that Fortune St. Germain guy he has on a lot, but I heard this and I totally vibed with it because uh, it resonates true to something that I've been holding for quite a while that I think I first sort of got turned on to understanding through Tesserion, back to him. I'm glad he's coming up a lot in this chat. He is deep into the philosophy of, of dualism. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I lo- anyway, I love his work and he has a lot to say about philosophy, aesthetic philosophy, that aesthetic philosophy is sort of falling by the wayside. The philosophy of beauty, basically, mm-hmm. is what that is. And uh, I think it was Fortune, maybe, on a Crow episode, but somebody somewhere was in that in the Crow sphere was saying how uh, there will come a time in the near future where our survival will be completely depending on beauty. And I really like, they didn't elaborate on that too much. And I was like, you know, I get that. I understand that because a big part of what is throwing the ship of society off course is that what is it, what is and isn't beautiful has lost its objectivity. And, you know, there are some things that you could describe as beautiful that are subjective, but then there are things that are objectively aesthetically beautiful and pleasing like the flowers that Michelle started this conversation with. When you see flowers in bloom, that is objective beauty that we're hardwired to recognize that this is the opening of, (laughs) you know, the opening part, like the blooming, the culmination of a long process that nature has undertaken from seed to sapling to, you know, all the steps along the way till you get to this blooming. And part of what is really hurting us right now with the toxicity of society is, or what is causing a lot of the toxicity is that people won't call a damn ugly hoe an ugly hoe <laughs> or like a nasty, you know, a nasty greaseball dude, a nasty greaseball dude. And like, I, I know this is obvious stuff, but like I was at my dad's, my dad and mom's house tonight and he's flipping through TV channels and I don't know what cable channel it was, but a commercial pops up for like a TV show called my big fat, beautiful life. And it just showed this like big fat lady all glammed up. And like, she was the star of some TV show and there's no love loss for people that have different levels of health. Right. But we can't be objectively, we can't be in the, we can't be in the truth of things. If we look at dis-ease, self-harm, imbalance, and call it beautiful, because that is a huge, it's just like so much else that goes on in terms of psyops in the world. From a young age, being taught and trained to believe what authority says or what society says over your own senses. And a lot, like, you know, you look at a McDonald's cheeseburger and fries in real life, not like whatever they do with the glamour shots of the commercial or the pictures on the menu. That is not, there's, that is not beautiful. It is objectively ugly, right? Taco Bell taco never looks like the the picture. (laughs) In fact, like pretty much all the corporate food, you know, the glamour shot on the box is not what you're actually getting in the process final product. So so many examples of this. And if we really get real with ourselves about what is and isn't beautiful and we don't lie to ourselves about it and we structure our life in a way to bring about as much beauty into ourself on all sensory levels as possible and either fix and bring back to balance or create boundaries against that which is not beautiful, we will be doing we will be detoxing ourselves on a lot of levels of the fractal, a lot of levels of the spectrum, right? And then things that are beautiful <laughs> get called ugly. Like, you know, you got dirt all over your feet. To me, that's beautiful. <laughs> but there's at least, an, I, I think we all get what I'm saying here. And <laughs> that the philosophy of what you're talking about with the, you know, the swordsman who's a poet, this is somebody that recognizes beauty and they're not trying to create the packaging of something shiny. You know, they're expressing what's the inside themselves. 
They're bringing what's within them out. And that is a beautiful process as well. That's like poetry is, I think, meant to be, you know, about communicating beauty more than anything else. And even that type of expression has fallen into uh, a lot of sort of degenerated things compared to what the po the epic poets of old would do. Like, you know, even, even Dante's Inferno, even when he's writing about the most horrific of the rings of hell, <laughs> he's do like, there's beauty. It's aesthetically beautiful. The whole, the whole thing, you know? So, you know, from our language to our diet, to the people we surround ourselves with and what we do and do not accept as okay. I think beauty is like ultimately a guide that will not do us wrong. As long as we don't lie to ourselves and accept that which is ugly and toxic as beauty because we're told to do so. That makes me think of um, the saying that Topher Gardner talks about a lot. And that is um, that nature is constantly signaling to us to realize, you know, when, what, when we realize what the signal is and we mimic that and signal back to it, then there is this um, appreciation in the environment and actually life-giving appreciation in the environment. And that on a natural level in, in the way that, you know, on the premise that our, if our species ought to survive, then we'll have to, uh, there'll be an economy of beauty. Then I think that it, that we could rest that on this returning to the signals of nature, finding what they mean, the, 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 the way that it's seeing the, the phi, the phi ratio in a flower, seeing that golden ratio spiral in a sunflower or in a pine cone or in an egg and, um, and appreciating that for what it is, the fingerprint of God, the, and then, you know, um, in the, in the way that we would mimic that, um, that's where I, that's how, that's, a, that's where I'm trying to work that out. Of course, there's like the inversion of phi, right? Like this, that's the, that's the phi, you know, the screen that we're looking at right now, there's also the phi. So there's this inversion as well, where it's like, no, but look at, you know, if, if the screen was, if this, if the screens that we were looking at right now, like on our laptops and computers were square, it would be less, we, or, or like circular or something like that, or I don't know, in this oval or some sort of non phi ratio, I guess I'm not giving a good example, but, um, it would be less inviting to like hold our attention and pull us here because we're drawn to mm. that signal. Um, and so how we s signal back the, the, the communication that we offer, I, I think is not, uh, it's not something that I can really expand on because I, I think that's a very personal, I think that's really the connection with the spirit where your spirit meets, um, um, Sorry, it's, it froze there for a second. Um, but yeah, that's that made me think of that. I've been thinking about that a lot since I've heard him say that. And uh, I think it's really interesting trying to discover the ways of s signaling back to the to the creation that what we, you know, the beauty that we see and, and, and say, what life could this bring? What life, what what beauty this is? Let me, may I make this into medicine, please? This would this will make mm -hmm. such good medicine. Thank you. Thank you for this beauty and this bounty. And, um, and that's the, the life-giving survival, I suppose, you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I think about this often. I mean, I mean, I think about, I thought about it today. I went on a hike and there, um, there's a section of the trail that has split off because one part of the trail is all eroded and it's really, tricky to walk down you basically you will you will fall if you walk on it and people have started to move right next to it and there's all of these rocks that create the attraction that you would need to be able to come down and there's a branch that's right next to this area that's really tricky and every time i go on this trail i grab that branch and i think and then I, I afterwards i thank the branch out loud and i say thank you branch and today it made me think about one of the videos that Mario just released about Virgo and talking about the branch 
and that in in the Bible, the branch is actually the word for Virgo's son, S O N. And it mm. made me stop in my tracks. And I thought to myself, I need to stay here and just think, like sit with this for a second. And the wind just came through and just blew this big gust of wind. And it was like this confirmation that I picked up on what was right in this area that nature was trying to show me. Wow. And then it made me think about the masculine and fem feminine, knowing that we were having this discussion. And I was like, oh my God, the branch is the son who's offering his hand to the passerby to offer and provide the structure and something stable in, an, in a moment where there's instability. And then I thought about just the gesture of a gentleman who offers his hand to a woman to allow her to pass over a rocky you know, area or a puddle or whatever it be. And it was just this like beautiful like spark that I had of like, oh my gosh, this to me is just like an example that nature is giving me of this, this divine wow. masculine feminine connection that's there. And it's like everywhere. And it's specifically in nature, you know, even just looking at the structure, like you're talking about of flowers. And then I always think of a pine tree with the masculine and I, there, we live around a lot of pines. So I just feel like there's, um, I don't know. There's just constant reminders everywhere you look uh, in nature of these dynamics and once you start to see it and once you can look at the world and look at people and creation itself as like a holistic thing, I think that's when these things like really start to click. Um, and yeah, so I just really love, I'm a very verbal and like you said earlier, Kyle, physical. So I love to work with my hands and I, I notice myself, I talk to plants all the time. <laughs> and somebody, <laughs> I'm sure people, I mean, now we live in a place where there's not a lot of people around, but I would just unabashedly do it all the time. And I'm sure I made a lot of people be like, what the heck, this girl's just you like know, talking. You're gonna end up married to a, to a tree nymph. <laughs> yeah right without even knowing it and so anyway just yeah these little things i just think that they're listening and um just like with spirit or our ancestors or whatever they're always there for us on so many levels and i just think they're always there listening and they they see that when we're acknowledging them and we acknowledge you know it's like this back and forth thing um and it's 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 just beautiful and it's one of the things that herbalism has taught me and just mother nature has taught me and I could go on and on, but yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's a thing of beauty and it's all there for us to be connected to. I love that, Michelle. Um, yeah, I love that. And I think some people would be nervous about being animistic. Um, mm. but I think there is some value. It, it would be like me saying, like something, you know, really good happens and me saying thank you to you specifically. Because <laughs> um, I mean, I could look right at your face and be like, well, thank you, God. And how would you feel? You know, how would you feel? Um, yes, I'm acknowledging that you're the one and all. But I'm not recognizing you. So I think there is something valuable about you saying thank you, Branch. You know, recognizing this particular part of the universe, this particular part of God is helping you out. That's really magical and it's really special. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with the artist Andy Goldberg. And it's true. It is true. And it's it's so much fun. I love going on hikes and messing around with nature. Like whether it's giving a rock a new home um, by throwing it into a new location or just making art out of it along the trail. Because I think that's a really beautiful, fun thing, too, is, I mean, maybe you're sitting there enjoying the moment and then being playful with it. Now I made a smiley face on your on your branch or in the dirt, or now I've arranged some flowers in this direction and making something sacred and fun. Um, you know, that's that's something that, you know, I like to do and just be kind of silly about it. But but I think we can. I mean, that's that's why we have ritual. That's why we have, you know, these these festivals during seasonal times of year is to celebrate this relationship and make something beautiful out of it. You know, that's, I think it's wonderful. I think it's so much fun. I told and Kyle this story while we were at the park. Oh, were you still talking? Sorry, Rachel. Can't oh, no, see your fine. face. So I don't know. I know. Cues. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to add, you know, I think, you know, I think you're right. You, both of you, um, Kyle and Michelle, it's like, 
you know, when you start to interact with, with spirit, you see these dynamics that we're talking about play out in such a natural way. You just see it. It's so clear and it's so obvious and it's so beautiful to watch it interact. And you can learn from it so easily, I think, in that way. But that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I told this story to Kyle when we were on our walk at the park by my house, but there is this lake, a big pond lake thing at this park, a huge park by my house. I love it so much. And a couple of years ago, a tree got taken down by some beavers or a beaver. I don't know. And this tree fell over into the water and, you know, the log of this tree is laying there in the lake. And I was walking by one day, the tree wreckage, and I heard some other walkers stop there and they were lamenting. They're like, I can't believe the beaver killed that tree and stupid beaver and bad beaver. And, you know, <laughs> like they were really upset about it for whatever reason. You know how people are that just are ready to complain, of course. So just complaining. And a few, you know, a few days later, I came back around to that same spot and I looked at the tree in the lake and it had become a resort for turtles. They were just soaking up all the sun <laughs> and there was like eight turtles on this tree. And ever since then, that's like turtle tree and that's their spot. And the tree is still there and everything. The, the log is still there. So this is a great example of like in this metaphor, the beaver, is the masculine it's even got that fa you know phallic beaver teeth right it didn't take down no other trees in the entire park have ever that i've seen been destroyed by beavers there's no like anti-beaver defense system stopping that from happening <laughs> you know the beavers just somehow god in the form of a beaver knew that that tree needed to come down for the turtles to have a spot to be in the sun but not be like exposed to other things still be in the water. So the turtles in the metaphor are the feminine, you know, they're even circular. They have this shape. They, you know, they have a shell, they carry their home with them. A lot of reasons why you can correlate that. And by the masculine fulfilling its purpose, not even necessarily knowing why it's fulfilling its purpose. It's just doing what it's called to do. Then the feminine has builds a home out of that. <laughs> you know, like I love that. And so we can look at, we can be like the people that see the tree fall down and be like, fuck beavers, smash the patriarchy. <laughs> or we can be like the turtles and be like, this is a nice place to get some sun. I'm going to get some sun. That would be a really confusing bumper sticker for some people, I think. Like, fuck beavers, <laughs> smash the patriarchy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> people be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> free, free the box. Turtle. Yeah. <laughs> that's too good yeah but, like, you know god in the form of beaver did something for god in the form of turtle that's how i really see it though for sure i did not realize like i was... need some french people <laughs> <laughs> who who thinks bothersome should come in and just give us like a 10 minute heathen diatribe about maleness <laughs> Do it. Do it. To do it. Saga <laughs> of <laughs> Beaver. Okay, if you don't, but you're invited to. <laughs> I just can't not think of Primus when I even hear the word beaver. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm just thinking about Primus, but anyway. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe Kyle, you've heard this before, but I was uh, looking into a few things before we started. And one of the things I came across was that frankincense is actually like historically, obviously frankincense is like a huge deal. It's like been around forever. It's like a sacred scent. It's a sacred resin. But um, basically the um, practices that it's, it can both, it can be used to harness both the divine feminine and divine masculine. And that it's been used like throughout history to worship sun gods and even moon goddesses. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but I just I just came across this today and I was like, oh, interesting. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Hmm. No, makes sense to me. I, I call it tree gold. Ah, it would be like the you know, because it's like it's like a golden tier. I think 
Tears of the Sun is another name for frankincense. Speaking of the French, and uh, <laughs> and the I, yeah, no, that I, I don't know. That makes sense to me because it is a it's the type of scent that is in a base, middle, and high. So it has like the the lowest point of the of the aromatic spectrum, as well as the peaks, which are usually like the more masculine type of sense. Ah, yeah. I never thought about that, but that makes sense to me. Um, it also makes sense to me because of the way that it's associated with trade and opening up trade routes and the sea and the shipping and movement of, uh, you know, bodies from one continent to another. And oh, that would have to be like over a sea or something like that in a lot of ways and, and the spice road too. But um, yeah. So when, when plants, when plants have that kind of like, global sea trade um, history to them. I, I often think of them as having like a lot of feminine um, blessing to them, you know, in the same way like coffee and tobacco and, um, you know, cannabis and cacao, things like that. Yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. As my gears turning on, um, <clears throat> the you know the three wise men bringing uh, frankincense, gold, and and myrrh. Uh, it's just kind of it's, it has me fascinated at the possibilities of frankincense, meaning you know it being enfranchised. And what that would mean with the other, the other gifts. What do you think about the word Boswellia? That's what the botanical name is, Boswellia. Mm. That that ding any bells for you? Kind of, yeah. It makes me makes me think of uh, so Bos is um, the ox. So like Bostrophodon is how the ox plows is like riding in both. Back and forth. Boswellia. Boswellia. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Boswellia. I think it's interesting, too, to the three wise men's gifts that... <laughs> okay. So I hadn't really thought about frankincense and enfranchisement. That's an interesting link. I don't know. I don't know what else we might be able to dig out of that, but um, myrrh, since Jesus is a solar deity, it's interesting that he's offered myrrh because Adonis is from the myrrh tree. His mother, myrrh or Mira, got pregnant with him when she wasn't supposed to, kind of like a divine conception, but they were mad about it, and she was turned into a myrrh tree as punishment for her immaculate conception. And then Adonis falls from her as like a seed or an acorn and is carried into the underworld, I think by Venus where he then grows up and becomes the beautiful solar sun God deity. So continuing that long tradition of the solar deity and the myth of the corn, the corn myth, <laughs> where hmm. we have like the Cronus name from as well. When Cronus was the sun before it got attributed to, uh, before Saturn was attributed to the luminary that we call Saturn now. Yeah, interesting. Uh, interesting you bring up acorns because that was another thing that came across my radar and acorns being a symbol of fertility. Um, and actually one of the practices that I learned of earlier this year or a tradition was that you would actually like harvest acorns and then save them for the spring. And as a symbolic like um, ritual or just a, something uh, symbolic like practice you could do is actually bury an acorn uh, with your your partner on the first day of spring. And anyway, just you saying acorn made me think of that. So maybe there's something just with um, that being part of the legend that it was just like a nod to the fertility and like the continuation of her immaculate conception, the birth, it's always going to continue to happen. And maybe the acorn is just symbolic of that. I don't know. Oh yeah, definitely is. That's the, 
Yeah, that's the whole corn myth. Why it connects to the solar deity is because the sun is the symbol of that constant flow from <laughs> the seasonal thing. You know, the sea suns. <laughs> the word sun is in the seasons. Anyway. Right. Yeah. I and I have to say, oh, go ahead, Rachel. <clears throat> oh, no, go ahead. I just wanted to say, uh, if Baldy does come in, I know we're like coming towards the end of the show, but uh, I have to bring up his uh, theory that he'll bring up about the sun actually being feminine and then the moon being masculine. And when I first heard him say that, I don't know, a few months ago on a podcast or something, it I just really started thinking about it. And I've been just like kind of like constantly thinking about it. And I think that a, a lot of it makes sense. And I'm going to pick his brain on it. Uh, coming up here soon because I have a lot of questions about it. But I, I mean, what do you guys think about that concept? I actually came to a really great deeper realization on this type of thing, like sort of reconciling different dimensions of syncretism that seem to conflict with each other from, of, of course, talking to Balderson. <laughs> so talking to him yesterday with this alchemy interview that I cannot wait to put out. Uh, he kindly said that was his best alchemy interview ever uh, in the chat earlier, which I think so, because I've listened to most of his interviews <laughs> and then like things really clicked for me. And <laughs> Lucas, he got that from me. I bet, <laughs> I bet he did. <laughs> uh, get a book out, dude. I want to I want to read your book anyway. So what I reconciled and this applies to more things like the masculine moon feminine sun idea was that okay so this mercury character hermes character attributing that to the sun when alchemically the sun is more you know sun is something else right i was trying to reconcile ast astro theology with alchemy because the symbols don't always seem to like one to one match why is you know we even see mercury in a lot of depictions on with the chariot uh you know of basically the same thing that helios is writing in which is the sun so like why would that be if mercury in terms of the alchemical process is not the same energy as what the sun brings to the alchemical process and i realized that it actually depends on the dimension through which we're perceiving it like the perspective lens we're putting on it so when we're talking about sun moon earth well, we've got a battery anode cathode relationship here. And that's one way of looking at the sun. But in a different, a different dimension, observational visual dimension, watching the sun go through its journey across the sky clock, it actually becomes more of a Mercury character when applied to that, not in relationship with Earth. In relationship with Earth and Moon, Sun has this feminine part of the battery going on cathode but in relationship to its position on the sky as it's traveling the sky clock it's more mercurial because in alchemy what the out al what step you're on determines what the mercury is it's not always literally mercury <laughs> as in like the substance and that's part of the confusion of terms too of course is that we have the physical substance called mercury and then we have the philosophical mercury which is carrying something from one place to another. It's either taking something from something or giving something to something, right? So different steps of the alchemical process, like the agent you're using to distill, you know, the liquid medium that you're using to distill uh, the oil out of the plant, well, that liquid is like the mercury. It's the thief. It's taking it away. But then in another step of the process, uh, like the oil might be the mercury now because it's giving something to another part of the alchemical process. Right. So the sun. So Mercury is like changing characters in terms of philosophical position in alchemy. In one step, it's one thing. In another step, it's another thing. And the sun is like that. And, you know, the sun in Virgo season is not the same as the sun in Aries season. And even throughout the day on the microcosm, the type of wavelength of energy coming from the sun at the morning is not the same light that's coming from the sun in the afternoon so that's kind of where i'm at reconciling the whole idea of the sun being feminine in a battery sense but still having the ability to look at it as a, a representative of the trinity the creator destroyer preserver 
the mother, father, son, or child. So like depending on the lens that you're looking at it through, it can fill its different characters, its different positions alchemically, it's different things astrotheologically. And really that's beautiful because it's exactly the same as how we are as beings too. Like, you know, in my role, if I was a swordsman, <laughs> you know, that's like a masculine role, but in my role as a, you know, a poet or a, a painter, that's kind of like a feminine creative role. It doesn't make you all the time a female or all the time a male to do the other side of the polarity in terms of how you're acting on the world. Is that all making sense? Yeah, you've inspired yes. some amazing thoughts. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. So uh, basically how I'm thinking about this as you're talking is seeing the sky clock as a way for the masculine to interact with chaos. Um, because if you've got the sun who, who's got, you know, these three stations, hey Ben, um, you know, it's got equinox, it's got solstice, um, it's got basically three positions it moves between. So that's like your maiden mother crone kind of thing, right? So you have these different time frames. So I'm seeing that. Um, but also it, it balances light and dark if we see the masculine is dark and earthy. So it has, you know, times for each night and day, you have both masculine and feminine, uh, just with the sun, not, not counting the moon right now, but cause the moon's another, it's a closer intimacy level that you have with light and it's a different pace, but that's how I'm kind of seeing it. So the sun, um, what I like about the Ticos system and how you're, how you're describing this um, in the Ticos, Mercury and Venus are moons of the sun. Um, the 3D model looks cool and I'm still working through the book, but it's something to, to check out and consider. But I like that because Venus as the morning and evening star kind of gives the masculine a heads up. Hey, so the sun's going to be rising. Hey, so it's not just light in your face. Boom, here's the, you know, here's that, you know, energy. Um, however you choose to see the polarities, however they, you know, show up for you. But you know, so that Venus kind of heralds that in. Mercury is always that that balance, like here's the communication between us. Here's the, you know, this is, it's always that mediator. We always need that. Um, I shared um, a poem from Gabe's book now and again in some of the chats. And so you'll have to listen to that, but it's a perfect example of, of the fool being that mercurial character. So those are just things that I'm thinking about is, is that the sky clock is really about these relationships of light and dark and how they play out. Uh, we can attribute all kinds of meaning to it, but I think at a very basic level, that's what these luminaries help light and dark do is to communicate. It gives them a sense of, okay, now we're closer with the moon. So if the moon is masculine and women's cycles always sync up with that, that is such a gentle guidance. That's like, Let's work together. Let's let's get your chaos in a way that I can understand it. I know now that you're going to go through this and here's your peak time. Here's your low time. I understand your flow now. I get it. It's a way that we can communicate and understand each other. And it's right there. It's right there. <laughs> it's, and it's not even complicated. It's very observable if you're paying attention. You know, I mean, even just paying attention to the moon this last year has made a huge difference for me. So, you know, even a woman paying attention, if a man can pay attention to the moon, he's got it. <laughs> pay attention to his site, you know, dudes, pay attention to your cycles. You know, how do you feel night and day? How do you feel interacting with the moon? Pay attention to those luminaries because that's your mercury. That's, that's the thing that helps us communicate if we're looking at light and dark and those polarities. So Thanks for inspiring all those thoughts. I think it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, bravo. Gosh, that's awesome, Rachel. I love it. So, Baldy, what makes a real man? Fantastic. <laughs> Lay it on us. That was uh, Agreed. The man's it was fantastic, supposed to be the rock. The, the man's supposed to be the rock. You're the structure. And and the the just like with uh, when uh, Michelle was describing how, like, for me, a uh, guy that holds his hand out to help a woman over a puddle. That's just kind of pathetic. 
but the way she described it, it sounded beautiful and perfect. And that just kind of opens that up. And I'm a hard ass. I am. We all know this. Anybody that's listened to me before, we know I am. <laughs> and, and, and that's what, uh, the feminine softens that side. Like you guys should have met me before Christy. Ooh, just me and the animals up on the mountain. Yeah. It was Spartan up here, you know, without the gayness. Um, <laughs> Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, keep that part out of there. Yeah. Just me and animals. Um, but yeah, and no, right. and no bestiality either. Just to clarify, yeah, none of that either. No, I, I, my just dog was basically my soulmate. But, <laughs> but yeah, you, you're supposed to be the rock. Um, and part of why I'm very much against chivalry is because it's like a, a a fake version of what it is to be a man. Like when I go out, I'm protecting Christy from mountain lions and bobcats and bears. And, and when I'm in the city, I will walk on the, the uh, street side of the sidewalk or sit on the outside of the, like if we're sitting in a bench seat. So if something bad is happening, it has to come through me before it gets to her. Um, but I, I'm not worried about a mud puddle. Uh, you know, she, she can handle a mud puddle. She's pretty good at that. Uh, she's very capable, uh, you know, and on the farm, women do a lot of things that dudes one, one of the very interesting things is I have a lot of guys come here and visit and a lot of guys find chopping wood to be like just this, the biggest manly thing. And in Hollywood, they do kind of act like that. Like if you're chopping, going out and chopping wood, you're a big man. That's a woman's job on the farm. Uh, I go out and I cut down the trees. I'm out dealing with animals and the trees and stuff. Chopping wood's not hard. Um, I think part of uh, where a lot of the confusion has come in is just that in this very comfortable life, the things that men actually did are gone. We actually went out and, and, uh, when, you know, we, they always make it out to be war, but going out to trade your goods, say I've planted an entire field or raised a herd or did whatever. And now I've got to travel for four or five days through, uh, you know, uh, predator laden territories until I get to town to where now I've got to collect money and try and get that back home and whatever goods I purchased, there was true dangers. Um, there was all kinds of different things like that. I now instead we, and then, you know, you had the camaraderie of, of uh, a team of men, like you lived in an area, the team of men would work together to do certain things. Um, Build, build different projects. If there was a defense of the area needed, they did that together. We replaced that with sports ball, like uh, uh, Chance keeps talking about, where now sports ball is your team, your your guys, and if they win, you win. Like, and, and you're in no way affiliated with them just because you're wearing a rain uh, a, a Raiders jersey or whatever. Uh, it doesn't make you affiliated with those people, or that's your team. This is specifically designed to replace the needs that you had as a man. And just like uh, Minecraft, I can't stand that game because the things were like my friends and I, when I was a kid, we would go out and build forts. And we learned a lot about building by building those forts. What kind of materials work? What kind of things don't work? Got hurt a lot because you did something wrong and you don't do that again. <laughs> like, hey, that That's how that works. Um, there's all kinds of things that you learned about the world and about using what's available to you and about making things available to yourself. And it, you, that game is made to, to fulfill all of that. And all those games are, and it's to try and make you so you're less, not a man. So now we've now switched over to where now the things that a woman would normally do, the guys are supposed to do half that chore and part of that is, is they aren't doing like I go out and I fix the electrical systems. I go out and fix the plumbing systems. Is Christy underneath, is Christy underneath the car, you know, screaming and sweating while the car it, fixing things underneath the car? No. So am I inside cooking dinner? Nope. Am I washing the dishes? Nope. Is she outside pushing the bull around? Like, like when the two bulls get out and they're trying to pop the goat like a pimple because they're just pushing on both sides of him. Like, why are you doing that? Like, but not, now the goats are, now the bulls are ornery 
And now I've got to go out and deal with that. And the bull's looking at me like, oh, you want to get popped by a pit, like a pimple punk? I'm like, no, not really, dude. Um, <laughs> she, you know, I, I'm not going to ask Christy to come down there and do that. So she's going to sit up here and do these kind other kind of things. Um, and, and part of that is just the biology of how we're made. Even though Christy and I, uh, at different points have weighed about the, about the same, we weigh very similar weights. I'm just naturally 10 times stronger than her. If, if I hit her, she's at full strength. She's going to be blasted for a week. I'm going to pry hospitalize her. She hits me and I'm like, why did you do that? It's it. We have a different bone density. Our muscles work different. I'm supposed to be out doing these things, not these. And they've done their best to fulfill all those needs that a man would have done. And then made this other code of things that make you manly, like drinking beer and watching sports ball and blah, blah. And I can't imagine sitting down for four hours and watching a, a, a football game. Like, really? I've got so many things to do outside that are so manly. Like coming back in with man glitter on, you know, I just went down and saw and saw the part four trees and now we have wood for one week <laughs> yeah, during the winter. So my wife can heat, you know, heat the home and cook and do all those things. Uh, you know, so I'm stinking like uh, pine trees and things like that or covered in oil doing real man things. It, it, it's not, uh, uh, I went and cleaned my area. And also the thing where I, men had shops, they had shops and labs and things where you went in and there was dangerous, sharp stuffs everywhere and explosive things. And you were doing stuff. You didn't have your little, uh, game room with your TV and you sat down with the boys. And when man I was a cave. kid, yeah, the man <laughs> cave. And, and when I was young, and I hung out with my friends. We didn't sit around and watch TV like a bunch of Nancys. Are you serious? Like, what, are we going to sit and watch some soap poppies, you know, with mom? Are you kidding me? We were out underneath the hood of a car or or building something or snowmobiling or whatever it was that, that we decided to do that we were doing an activity together. And even now when guys like... It's it's kind of a running joke between some of my friends. Like you go over to Balderson's house, just prepared to work. That's what we do. We work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to hang out with Snake Jones one time, and he just made me shovel chicken poop. Yes, <laughs> that was the best. It was like, yeah, it was awesome. hang out. Just that was really good. <laughs> I'm proud of you. That's like you know, I go to my grandma's house, and he, we've we've told you know. My brother-in-law and all the guys were like, "If when you come, just be prepared to do some things. Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're just things that, you know, only only dudes can do <laughs> really well. Yep. And I mean, granted, she's also old, but, you know, just be ready to do things. So. Well, and, and honestly, that's what I do. Like, I don't feel comfortable sitting around having tea time like a girl. Like, you know, that's not what guys do. <laughs> like okay, do you need some electrical work done? I see something over here isn't right. Let me go deal with that. And you guys do your thing. Like as a heathen, that's a very separate thing in our community. Like guys don't go into the woman area where women are doing women things unless they're asked in there to like carry something or something. We don't bother with that. And they don't come out and bother with us. They're not like, are you turning that wrench right? Are you <laughs> sure that the work on that is 28 pounds? Like, so, you yeah, know, back oh, in my TV watching days, I remember an episode of The Office, which is such a psyopy show once you kind of dig into like Scranton, Pennsylvania and Jesuit shit. But uh, <laughs> The Office has this character, Dwight, who is depicted as like this buffoonish. He's the, you know, a clown character to the cast, right? You're supposed to laugh at Dwight. Everything he does is weird and not normal. And I remember an episode where he like gets invited to some dinner party that the other cast members were at. I don't really, really remember the details, but the joke was that while everyone else was, you know, entertaining themselves and having their tea time party, whatever dinner party, he was just like lurking around the house, looking for things that were broken and fixing them. 
because that was because because <laughs> he's weird and you're supposed to laugh at him. Yeah. What a weirdo to do that. But like, that's the inversion is they're making that guy the buffoonish clownish character when he's doing he's the manly one. You know, that or was you even look at tool time. Uh, Tim is even though he's the one who's kind of buffoonish. He's the star. He's the one with the pretty wife, the nice house and all that. Al, the actual competent dude, they make him very mousy, you know, and they make Tim very overbearing and they make Al mousy and he can't even have a woman or anything, but he's the actual competent one who actually knows how to do things. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, you know, I actually, I had this roommate situation like this um, where the owner of the house lady love her to death um but she she would get frustrated with some of the male tenants who would come and stay because they would fix stuff and it's like well okay i get that maybe there's a respect and a boundary issue with that you know you're those are my things this is my home property type of thing but at the same time you can't be mad at a man for doing what comes naturally like <laughs> I'm like, you can't be mad at this. I'm not mad at it. Please, by all means, fix this. Because I don't know about you, but I get frustrated being in my masculine all the time. It, I don't want to do that. So, you know, it's nice when somebody's like, hey, can I fix this? Yes, please. Please do. Because you have the knowledge and the skill set that I do not. I cannot focus on being in flow. I cannot focus on feminine qualities of myself when I have to keep stepping into your role. And I think that's important for a lot of women now. You know, it's like if you keep taking on this role, you can never actually sink into yourself. You Do you know what yourself looks like when you're being somebody else ever? You, if you're trying to be that all, you, you're not really being the one and all like you think you are or you wish to be or you crave to be because I can tell that some people really want that. But not when not when you polarize to the extent that you've got to make up for it. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the philosophical everything from nothing idea that the <laughs> pleroma, everything in its opposite, is similar to the void. That at that level, there's this paradox going on. You know, why is there existence instead of non-existence? How does something come from nothing? That whole chestnut. And whenever you try to have it all, like I, <laughs> I live by myself, you know, I'm, uh, my bachelor pad does have pretty good energy. <laughs> like I do think that I'm right. decent aesthetics for, you know, I, I do my best to make it a home, but like, I can't do it all in terms of, you know, one, you know, one person living by themselves doesn't really make a home the same way as two people fulfilling complementary roles is able to do. I guess that's my point. Mm -hmm. And as hard as I try, like, you know, my yard is shit. My garden didn't do that. Well, I'm too, I'm too into like this work, you know, uh, not that that's an excuse, but I mean, there's literally only so much time in the day. And if you, if you spread yourself too thin on too many things, then not none of them are going to turn out that great so you know play to your strengths i guess <laughs> uh we got to start moving towards the wrap up to let flow state <laughs> kick off and i really appreciate you been popping in at the end here and giving us that great demonstration of like the nuts and bolts <laughs> pun intended <laughs> of uh <laughs> what like manhood should look like outside of the philosophy we've been talking about like you're actually doing shit you're actually doing work you're you got a lab you're making things happen but i want to make sure well, like I, the round table gets a Chris, chance to one of the things i wanted to put in about the feminine is i'm never as driven as when christy makes me driven like when i'm happy and that's when she's happy that's when i'm happy that and when she makes she makes me more happy than anything else I promise I'm ready to, I'm ready to build freaking, I'm ready to build an empire in the morning when I wake up, if the world's right with her. So uh, it, it's opening up that stone, it's enlivening that salt and making it so it's, it's free, it can move, you know, otherwise I'm just a hard ass sitting on the mountain screaming at goats. <laughs> <laughs>
You even laugh kind of like a goat at this point. You're becoming a goat man. <laughs> yeah, well, I want everyone to get a chance to give any closing thoughts and plug their stuff. You all are amazing. Kyle, let's start with you. Anything? You've been kind of quiet for a bit here. Any thoughts on all the riffs we've just been going into? Yeah, it's just uh, just soaking them in. And uh, some of these things have been really thought-provoking. So thank you all, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm uh, thinking about my the work dynamic that I have. I work. I have. I own a business with my wife. We have a shop in Milwaukee. Uh, we have a unique herb shop in the country that we make almost everything in our store, and um, uh, and there's not many like that. So a lot of the plants that we get, I go out into the field and I I, I get I get them, and I bring them into our kitchen apothecary and I turn them into medicine and I often joke that uh, I am the person that just puts potions into bottles like I'm just constantly putting stuff into bottles but I wouldn't be able to sell them if it wasn't for her aesthetic and her labels she makes the shop beautiful it's a beautiful shop because of her and Michelle said that earlier and I made sure that she heard that and in the back where all the press and the fire and the stuff, that's my spot, you know, <laughs> that's my spot. And I like uh, working hard back there. And I like bringing stuff from the field back there and picking the ticks off and coming into the, coming into the shop with some flowers for my wife, who is always there with a beautiful smile on her face. And we got a baby and the energy is just so great. And um, it's great to have, to have this uh, chat about the, Mas sacred masculine, sacred feminine dynamic, because I see it every day. I see it in my life. Um, I see it. I'm blessed to have it in my relationship and with my business that I work so intimately with my, my wife. And it's just like every it's, you know, it's, it's more than a business. It's our, it's our way of life. And it's kind of our dream, I guess. And, um, and uh, so that's what we do. We make medicine, we make herbal medicine, and a uh, little bit of, little bit of scruff, a little bit of fluff, you know, <laughs> and it's, uh, it's great. And um, so thanks Chance and thank you all for, for your thoughts and for letting me offer mine. It's a real pleasure. Um, Tippy Canoe Herbs is the, is the place. It's in Milwaukee, but we got a website online too. I'm doing this thing lately where I'm teaching um, astro aromatics. And I'm kind of writing a zine based on the astrological sign that we're in and then kind of talking a lot about the aromatic plants that are that belong to these particular signs, whether they're ruled by the ruling planet or under the influence of the ruling planet, I suppose. And um, and or, you know, the organ affinity of the particular um, zodiac sign and turning that into incense and hydrosols as well. So that's kind of my fun thing that I've been doing lately. I have a lot of classes that I, uh, I've always been a local kind of locals kind of dude, but I've been off, I've been branching out and I have an online class that I just started and I'll be doing those more and more. So, so I can, you know, be out in the world a little bit more and step away from my humble abode that has served me so well and get into this space where I can meet and rub shoulders with some very interesting folks like yourself. So. Thanks so much, man. It's great to have you. Can't wait for a full on Tipica new herbs, interverse conversation. You know, I'm going to want to know more about that astro aromatics. That sounds like gold. Yeah. It's really fun. Thanks. Yeah. You're an amazing teacher, man. Your enthusiasm and respect uh, for all the life forms that you are teaching about is really divine. <laughs> Appreciate it a lot. So yeah, everyone's excited that you're here and we can't wait to see you back. You're welcome to call in on a vibrant anytime. And let's hear from uh, Rachel. You got any closing thoughts for us? Oh, not too many. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation. It's been really fun. And I think we went into some really great territory and some really fun topics. And yeah, just thank you for that. Um, not too much else going on. I know that uh, be on the lookout later this month for a deep dive into the dark feminine. We will be covering covering that with a panel. So I'll have a little bit more on that later, but that is in the works right now. I've been wanting to have Tessarion 
back on interverse for that topic so looking forward to seeing what you guys have to say about that yeah thank you uh, sunforge on telegram i just dropped the link in the chats here oh, yeah. that's thank where you. people can follow rachel more closely all right michelle got any got anything for us here to wrap up with well, uh, yes, thank you for hosting because this was awesome. I'm really excited that I got an opportunity to talk with you all about all this stuff. And um, I guess, uh, you know, I too feel really grateful to be able to have um, the ability to have harnessed my divine feminine through mario as well like he brings that out in me and we we bring the opposite out in each other and just kind of like kyle said like and ben can attest to it too having being in a relationship with someone where you're able to actually be in these roles and feel the power of it and then see the benefit in the other person and then it just becomes this like you're just yeah christy yay good to see you um Yes, it's like you're just stoking each other's fire every single time you assume these roles and it just becomes this inferno that just it it just brings you closer to each other and it it just you start to emanate this out into the world and you can dynamic disequilibrium is how energy manifests from the potential into the physical. Yeah, it's it's incredible. And I mean, it was Mario who allowed me to I mean, it's like, uh, who is it Aretha Franklin, uh, you make me feel like a natural woman. Like I didn't, I never knew what that those lyrics meant until I was able to find that that partnership because it is it's like, wow. It's just like such an incredible feeling. So I'm grateful on that level. I'm grateful to be able to talk about this stuff because I've been wanting to talk about this subject for a long time. And I thank Rachel for being a catalyst in it too, because her and I have just been able to riff so much just in our little chats together. And I know both of us have just been like kind of chomping at the bit to talk about this. So I'll be joining her on the panel with the Dark Feminine, which I'm super excited about. Um, and uh, one thing I did want to say because I, I've heard a lot, um, and I, I don't know if women say this too, but I hear it a lot from men. Like there's a, there seems to have been like a big movement amongst men to like, they like just don't want to deal with women. It's like, eh, forget the women. MGTOW. I don't know. It's called MGTOW. Oh, MGTOW. Okay. Going their own way. Okay. So yes, when I learned about this, I'm like, wow, that's kind of brutal. And I guess like a message to a man that might be trapped in that cycle of thinking is that there's women out there that want to create this beauty with you. There are. And and, and I just feel like to just shut it down, it's you're doing yourself a disservice. And then you're also doing that woman a disservice who really wants, you know, to to do that and to create something like that. Um, so anyway, just like to know that don't give up on that and there are women out there who want to create this with you and um and, and working okay. on yourself is how you attract them not looking for them yes right as soon as it, <laughs> that's kind of the mystery of the feminine that hangs up a lot of guys is they're they're looking for the woman instead of working on themselves and following their purpose and you need to be doing the latter with openness and receptivity uh, you know space and some relaxation in there where of the focused mindset so that your inner feminine energy is in balance with your inner masculine energy and all the opposite gender that you attract into your life or that you have a relationship with, whether it's your mom, your girlfriend, or your current partner, all those dynamics are mere reflection of your relationship to when we talk about divine feminine, sacred masculine, we're talking about how this polarity of yin and yang exists across the fractal and your relationship to yin and yang determines what kind of experience you have in the fractal with males and females across the board. Totally. Yeah. And so lastly, just michelleshealinghome.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. That's the best way to know products that I'm putting out. I do very small batch stuff. That's kind of my specialty. Um, so I'll have like 13 items of one 
something that I made. And so when it's gone, it'll be gone. Um, but I'll always usually make it again. Uh, that comes out on every full moon. Um, and I'm also now offering consultations and I'm taking it in a different direction. So I'm, I, my uh, forte is making things and I love teaching other people how to make stuff, particularly things that you use on a daily basis, like deodorants or tooth powder or elderberry syrup. You might not be using that daily, but you know what I mean? Just like very uh, practical things. So if you're wanting to go into a deep dive and you want to learn more specifics on like how to make infused oils or things like that, that's where my consultations kind of will go into. So you can learn more about that on my website as well. Beautiful. What's next month? What are you putting out for us next month? Will or will that ruin the surprise? <laughs> I, I I don't know yet. I, I I actually I kind of like I have something in mind, but I usually kind of like wait to see what's going on, and a lot of it's seasonal too. So um, you know, I've got a lot of St. John's Wort in the pipeline that's like pretty ready to go. Um, so there might be something with St. John's Wort coming up. Sweet, yeah. I'm fascinated by that. I'll, every time I hear you guys bring it up and talk about it, I'm like, I would love to have a personal relationship with that herb and see what it's like. <laughs> yeah. oh, incredible. I swear you could do a whole show. You could do multiple shows on just St. John's Ward. I swear. I got the herbs that were recommended to me by you during the Kaylee Burkana moon day tarot you did where you had a tarot deck that was also herbs. Yeah. So I'll let you know how that goes. I've only tried the cherry bark tea so far. Oh, sweet chance. That's awesome that you did that. That's so cool. <laughs> I yeah, like yeah, I took that divination seriously. That's really a fun one. Uh, all right, I want to make an announcement. Music and Sky Festival, October 15th. Uh, 13th, I believe, is actually when it begins. 13th, 14th, 15th. I think it goes all the way to the 16th. It is Thursday through Sunday in Cuyama Valley, California. We're going to be partying with Mike Winner and crew from Alpha Vedic. And when I say partying, but I don't mean like getting, you know, wasted or intoxicated. I mean like an actual party of adventurers, you know, <laughs> in, in Kuyama Valley, California, music, uh, healing arts, all the good stuff, community, family, tribe. It's going to be so much fun. Join me there. You can use the coupon code chance 50 to get $50 off of the ticket. And I know some of you have already bought tickets, so I can't wait to see you there. And I'm incredibly excited for that weekend. I can't even explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there tuning people though. So if you want to meet, come to that festival if you can. It'll be awesome. Uh, Gabriel, bring it home, man. What do you got? Closing thoughts. Looks like he's frozen. Oh, yeah. It looked Whoops. like you're frozen. Okay. There you are. They've been messing with me lately. Oh, yeah. They're definitely messing with him. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, unfortunately, Gabriel's lagging out, but. The good news is he'll be here next week. So <laughs> we'll see you. See you all later. Uh, oh, yeah. Hit me up for a tuning. If you guys want to do a tuning session sooner than later, uh, definitely email me, chance at interversepodcast.com. Get on my schedule because, you know, once October, I have a lot of traveling going on. So once that is filled up schedule wise, uh, you'll have to wait till the next month. So, yeah, let's do it. Tune up. <laughs> really crazy results lately. I mean, they always are. But uh, love you all. Good night. See you on the flow state of Weaving Spiders. And see you next week. And watch out for the next Interverse episode where Balderson teaches us about alchemy. And you're actually going to get it. <laughs> you're, like, really going to get it. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank Peace you. Out. Ciao. Ciao.